BetUS, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. Stand up! New York Giant fans. Bad Dog, we're back. Draft is a week closer, man. Four weeks away. By the way, speaking of BetUS, you guys can take advantage of that 125% match deposit on your first three bonus, uh, your first three deposits of $100 or more. Link in the description and the promo code JOIN125. Hey, the NFL drafts here. You can bet on the NFL drafts. Trust me when I tell you, the amount of prop bets BetUS has is incredible. Who's going to go second overall? Who's the first quarterback off the freaking board? Or who's the non-first quarterback off the board? It's it's crazy. So you're going to have a lot of fun with with. Uh, Bet us. We're gonna have a lot of fun talking about all this stuff that we've been talking about, Chris, because well, it's the crazy season. And yeah. the last time we were here, you know, there was all the talk about JJ McCarthy and JJ McCarthy's stock rose, and JJ McCarthy was a day two pick in the middle of the year. Now all of a sudden, there's talk about him being the number two pick. In the draft, because a lot of people are saying that Washington, a lot of people are picking Washington to now take J.J. McCarthy. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I, get it. Well, you you know I've you know I've liked J.J. McCarthy all along. I didn't like him this much. I, I didn't think he would rise this much. I thought I definitely th- thought he was going to go in the first half of the first round, uh, just based off his potential and his upside with his traits and everything else, but. Uh, yeah, it's been a, uh, a huge rise now for McCarthy where, like you said, if you went back a month and a half ago, all the experts had him going either late first, early second round. Now he's, I'd be stunned if he doesn't go in the top four, top five. I will be, I'll be too. I, I will be stunned. Uh, based off everything you're hearing, like all you're hearing is, uh, if, if it's not them, it's Minnesota looking to potentially trade up. Like it's looking more and more, you know, as, as we get closer to the draft that, there's going to be four quarterbacks that go in the first five picks. And I think that's good news for the Giants, no matter how you want to look at it. Yep. It, it, it. The way I look at it, Bad Dog, is if the Giants want a quarterback, they sit in an ideal spot out of ter- teams that want to trade up. They have more to offer than anybody else. For the simple reason that you're picking sixth overall, a team that trades back is still going to be able to get a Marvin Harrison Jr. or a Malik Neighbors with that pick more than likely if four quarterbacks are going in the first four picks. If you trade back to 11 with Minnesota or 12 with Denver, you don't have that to offer. So if the Giants want a quarterback, they have as good of an offer as anybody else to offer to said team if they want to move up. If they don't want a quarterback and four quarterbacks are going to go in the first four picks, you're getting Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. Like you're getting a stud. Like Marvin Harrison Jr. could argue, most people would say if he's not the most talented player in this draft, he's the second most. Mm-hmm. And if the Giants stand pat, they get they get the 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 probably the best wide receiver prospect in the what the last five. Six, yeah. if, I mean, like, since Jamar Chase at the very least to come out in, in a draft class uh, with the sixth overall pick. So uh, I think it's a great situation to be in for the Giants, and it's going to be hard to screw up. I agree. I mean, the fact that J.J. McCarthy is rising up the boards like ahead of the Giants now, it, it definitely helps the Giants because the Giants will be in the driver's seat. Like you said, they're going to get an elite wide receiver without question if four quarterbacks go in the first four picks or the first five picks. And either that or if, you know, for whatever reason, the Giants say, you know what, we can get a wide receiver in the second round. We'll take Minnesota's first two picks, you know, the first two round or their first their two first round picks is what I'm trying to say. Um, they're in the driver's seat, but I agree. Um, this is just crazy. I, I just can't believe how much like his stock has risen to this point. And, and again, I don't. I, I'm no scout, so I, I don't know what these guys see. I, I really don't. We talked about it last week. I think if McCarthy went to Minnesota, I think he's yeah. set up to do very well there. Yeah. I think if he goes to a team like Washington, like the Giants, like the Patriots, a team that is not good, 
I think that he'd struggle. I mean, maybe he would get it together, but this would be a total, it'd be culture shock to McCarthy because you're playing behind one of the best offensive lines in the game. You're playing with probably one of the best running games in collegiate football. You have the best team around you. You have an NFL head coach already in Harbaugh and he's back in the NFL and you had an elite defense. You were not asked to carry Michigan. You were not asked to win games there. And I'm not saying that he can't, but I'm also not saying that he can. Do we know that he can? Can he get to a Washington? Can he deal with the pressure in his face all the time? Can he go to the Giants and have constant pressure? Remember, we gave up, what, 90 sacks last year? Can he succeed? Can he be the guy? I'm going to get rid of the ball quick. I'm going to get off my first read. I'm not going to hesitate. Can he do that? If he's asked to do that, can he do that? There's no more Saquon Barkley here either. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the questions I have about McCarthy. Where Minnesota, you're going there with Hawkinson. You're going there with Addison. You're going there with maybe the best wide receiver in football right now and Justin Jefferson. It'd be a really good situation for him there. I think he'd step right in and succeed there. And again, maybe yeah. he would succeed uh, with a lesser team, but. I don't know. I guess they're all, you know, they're all risks. We know this. Every quarterback yeah. is a risk. There's no surefire bet. But I've been saying this since, you know, this has come out that the Giants are interested in them. I, I'm just worried that this is going to be a totally different situation, and I don't know that he could handle it. It's also different playing in New York. I'm not mm -hmm. saying mentally he couldn't handle it, but th there's a lot more pressure to play here. You know, not that Michigan is a small school or anything, and there wasn't expectations, but it's just New York is a different animal. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I'll be happy with Malik Neighbors. You know, they took him out to dinner, and I, I, I like Romo Dunze myself, but I have no issue with any one of these three wide receivers. None. And don't reach for a quarterback just to take one. I, don't yeah, I, I, I don't think any, if, if the Giants don't trade up, I can't imagine anybody being upset if the Giants end up with Malik Neighbors or if they end up with a Marvin Harrison Jr. or right. even a Roma Dunze. Like, you're getting a legitimate number one wide receiver. And for all the people that always say, oh, well, you don't have the quarterback to throw to him, I get that. And if you love a quarterback, you're always going to take the quarterback above the elite wide receiver prospect or the elite anything prospect. It's the most important position yeah. if you love the quarterback. But when the Minnesota Vikings drafted Randy Moss, their quarterback was a 35-year-old Randall Cunningham. When the Arizona Cardinals took Larry Fitzgerald in the first, whatever, five, six, seven picks, whatever it was, they had an, I don't even know who their quarterback was. He wasn't good. Um, so if you if you don't love a quarterback and you feel you have a game-altering wide receiver prospect like these guys are, you take them. It's, uh, to me, it's not even a question. The only question for me, if you're not going quarterback, if, you, if you're not going to take one of these receivers is, do you entertain Joe Alt? I, and, and I don't think they will. I think all signs point to that they won't. And I know Giants fans would explode if they did that. But if we're not trading up, I'm very, very confident in saying that I think we're going wide receiver. Because I, I just can't see one of these top four quarterbacks at this point getting to six. I think there's just too much chatter. I think teams are going to move up to get them. I think, they're, I, I think the first four picks are going to be quarterbacks. I really do. Yeah. I think the first four picks are going to be quarterbacks. Uh, so another one to bring we up. Trade up. We trade up for J.J. McCarthy or Drake May or whoever, or we stay at six and take a wide receiver. Those are really the only two options I see. I agree. And listen, who was the quarterback in Detroit when they took Calvin Johnson? Like, you know, it wasn't Matt Stafford yet. So, yeah, listen, man. To me, if you're drafting sixth and you can get the second-best wide receiver in a an incredibly great wide receiver class as opposed to the fourth-best quarterback, I think you got to go wide receiver. And you might not even have the ability to get the fourth best quarterback either. Um, no. And it depends on who you ask. Because, listen, I, I've said since the beginning, Michael Penix is actually my second favorite behind Caleb Williams. And you guys know I love Michael Penix. And Michael Penix today is pro day. Oh, by the way, a lot of Giants scouts, front office, a slew of them went to Washington's pro day. And for all those people that told me, oh, Michael Penix, he's a statue. He can't move. He can't run. He's slow. Yeah, four, four, six. He's not slow. He's not immobile. He can run. He chooses not to. And that's one of my favorite things about Michael Penix is he stands in a pocket and makes throws. Now, granted, again, Washington's offensive line was a lot better than ours. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't have the luxury of sitting back there for four seconds. But he can run. 
he's fine. The questions with Michael Penix to me were never his skill set, his athleticism. He also had a 36 and a half inch vertical leap. He was throwing 70 yard missiles, dead on balls accurate. None of that worries me. His worries, obviously, are the torn ACL. You know, that yeah. he did tore that twice and, and a shoulder injury. And the fact he's a lefty and yeah. that FBL would be protecting his blind side. I love Michael yeah. Penix. Second favorite quarterback in his draft class, Chris. I don't want him six. I've said that before, too. I don't want him six either. There's too many questions. His questions are different than McCarthy's questions to me. But yeah. I don't want – again, this is just my brain. So people see things differently. But to me, there's – I don't want a quarterback that comes in with a lot of question marks at six. I, you yeah. you got to have a guy that can step in right away. You mentioned before, and the guy's got to be an elite talent that high. He has to be, and immediately. Yeah. L listen, I'm not going to fault Shane if he takes a quarterback. That's for sure. No matter who it is, I'm going to give him his chance to pick his guy. I get it. Uh, Bo Nix, I'm going to puke. Bo Nix, I'd probably puke. But I get okay. it. He feels like he's <laughs> not going to have an opportunity like this again. This is his shot as a general manager. So if he wants to take that swing, I'm going to support it. Um, I just am scared to death that we're going to end up with another Daniel Jones situation. I don't want him to reach for a quarterback. But if he right. has conviction in the guy and he believes in the guy, take your shot, man. Take your swing. I I, I respect it. Um, things I like about J.J. McCarthy, I, and I'll tell you right now what I like. I've liked them all along. That's how you know I'm not talking bullshit. I've liked them all along from the start, back to October. Um, don't like them at six. I'm going to continue to say that. Much of the things that you said about Michael Penix, uh, I think it's a, it's a too much of a risk, especially for the state of the, this franchise right now. I think he has great mechanics. Like his footwork, it jumps out to me. And it makes sense. He was taught by Harbaugh, pro-style offense. That stands out to me. I do think he has really good mechanics. And I think teams are seeing that. Uh, that was that was something that stood out. And not that I'm comparing him to Stroud. But that was the thing that really stood out to me when I watched Stroud the year before. I loved his footwork. I loved his mechanics. McCarthy, to me, looks like a polished quarterback. I think he does have a very underrated arm in terms of arm strength. I'm not saying it's Josh Allen-like. I do think he has a plus arm. Um, so I'm not stunned that teams are falling in love with him. And the fact that he's young and he's got upside, I get it. And in a weird way, I think the unknown of McCarthy has helped him. Because teams are like, what can he be? We haven't got an opportunity to see these traits that we see that are potential a plus or a traits really shown on full display. So as crazy as it may sound, and it's weird that I'm saying this, the fact that he played for Michigan and the style of offense that they ran, when you see his God given ability with some of the things that he's at least capable of doing, I think he, in a way that is helping his stock a bit, which is, is crazy to say, but I, I think it's actually helping him a little bit. Yeah. No, I mean, those are really good points. And listen, Harbaugh says the best quarterback in the draft. So my, solution was okay you trade us justin herbert and you draft jj mccarthy jim harbaugh you draft him draft him in los angeles draft him fifth and give us justin herbert i'll take justin herbert we wanted justin herbert the first show we ever did together we wanted yeah. justin herbert to be the quarterback in the giants so give us you can have you can have our number six pick and give us justin herbert and you can uh you you know whatever that's that's that, that's a great solution since he's so good give us justin herbert you don't need him we'll take him but he's never won a playoff game i don't care there's a lot of quarterbacks <laughs> never won a playoff game that are really good yeah. um i mean daniel jones on a playoff game does that mean that he's better than <laughs> better than just Blake, Blake, Bo Blake Bortles won a playoff game right i mean yeah. come on uh, trent yeah. dilber won a super bowl i mean what are we talking about here yeah you know but no i mean it's a good point about mccarthy it, it really is I just, again, I just don't, I don't see it. It's just me. But I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you who I love, man. And, and I, I don't understand the, and I, I, I'm, I still think we're going wide receiver. I'm going to continue to say that. But I do too. I, I do too. I don't understand the recent knock on Drake May. Like everything I've seen all over. It's almost like people are looking to create more scenarios. And what I'll say about Drake May. It's the opposite of McCarthy. When I watch him, I don't see polished footwork. And maybe that's part of it. Like, I see a guy that at times looks like he's bumbling and stuff, and I get that part of it. But when I look at his traits, he's 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 a, he's a first overall pick to me in, in almost any other draft class. Like, his traits are off the charts for me. And, that, and that's what I think 
Joe Shane's going to be looking at. And if Drake May's available, the Giants are taking him. I'd be stunned if they don't take him. Um, his arm talent is off the charts. Caleb Williams is the number one quarterback in this class, but it's a rare class. In most classes, yeah. Drake May would be the number one. And I, I don't understand why Drake May's falling down, supposedly falling down these mock drafts. I, I, I've always thought that Jaden Daniels makes sense to Washington, not because I think he's the second best quarterback in this class. I don't, because he's a great fit for that offense. But I would be stunned if Drake, well, I'm not stunned. I mean, because you're hearing all this chatter, but he should not go past number three. Drake may should not go past number three in this draft. Maybe we get lucky. I would love Drake May. I would love Drake May. Maybe for once it, it turns in our direction and we get Drake May because, as you said before, we're not sitting here saying he's going to be Josh Allen, but remember Josh Allen coming out of college, his first year he was terrible. I mean, yeah. I think he threw like 12 touchdowns, 19 picks. He completed 52% of his passes, and he looked like a total bust. And then Brian Dable got to him, and then look at what happened. And Drake May, like you've mentioned, kind of has the Josh Allen skill set. It obviously would have to be developed because he's not – He's not there yet, obviously. He'd have to learn the NFL. You got to learn all the defenses. I mean, th listen, this is a tough league. There's such a gap between college and the NFL. The speed is different. The defenses are different. The, the complexity of the defenses, the blitz, the coverages, they're way different because you have 11 NFL talent players to play these, where in college you might have three. You can't play NFL defenses with a collegiate team because they don't have 11 NFL players on the side of it, on the side that side of the ball. They don't. So it's just really different. It, to me, it really comes down to guys that work hard and study film and are able to adapt. You know, I've always felt like Daniel Jones had still do feel like he has really good physical talent. I, I, I don't, when people say he can't do things, um, I don't think it's that he can't throw. I think his arm is above average. I think that he's, I don't know how mobile he'll be now that he tore his ACL, but he's mobile. He can move. He's more accurate than people give him credit for. He's tougher than shoe leather. Uh, yeah. I give him that. I mean, there's a lot you can like about Daniel Jones, but I've said this for years now. The main problem with Daniel Jones is between his ears. He doesn't <laughs> process quick enough. He doesn't process plays quick enough. The, the speed of the NFL is too much for him. And when you're on a team like the Giants where it comes at you even faster because your receivers don't get open fast enough, your line can't protect you long enough, it really shows up there. And no. he's paid the price for it. He's struggled most of his career. He's been injured a number of times. And it's because it's just not a good fit. Again, put Daniel Jones on the Eagles. I'm not saying he's taking them to a Super Bowl, but I'm sorry. I don't give a damn how many Eagle fans get mad at me for this. I don't care. I don't think that they fall off that much from Jalen Hurts to Daniel Jones. I really don't. Now, you yeah. might not be push pushing Daniel Jones into the end zone. Uh, yeah. But I still think you could. It's not like Daniel Jones is a little guy. He's 6'5", 230, so you could do it. But if you give him A.J. Brown and you give him Dallas Goddard and you give him Devontae Smith and you give him an offensive line that can protect him, of course, uh, he's going to succeed. He'd be a, of course, of course, he'd be a much better quarterback than he is with us. Of course, yeah. Uh, I, I, the thing that stood out to me most with DJ last year, whatever it is, what it is, the circumstances were what they were. I understand he got money and a lot more pressure comes on him, and I get yeah. that. He was in a very, very tough situation last year when when Thomas went down and everything else. But the thing that really stood out to me last year, he really looked shell shocked. Mm -hmm. He really looked shell shocked. And I granted it was only four or five starts, and I know Andrew Thomas wasn't out there, but. He just looked, and I mean, in a way, you can't really blame him with how bad the line was, but he just, he, and for a guy that's his fifth year in the league, that's alarming. Uh, yeah. And and that, that to me is what really stood out with DJ last year. But I think at this point, if you're Joe Shane, you can't, you, I think Shane's already moved on from Jones. Long yeah, I agree. I agree. The, the, the question is, is he replacing him in this year's draft or is it going to be in the future? Yeah. Uh, does he feel like there's a guy worth taking at four? Because I think that's what he's going to have to do. Do, does he feel there's a guy worth trading up for early in this year's draft? Or does he say, well, we have so many holes, we could get an elite wide receiver. Uh, he, there's no way, in my opinion, at least right now, and opinions could change. Maybe Joe Shane's opinions change. If Daniel Jones suddenly throws 38 touchdowns, if he gets the opportunity to play next year, not right. banking on it. Um, but there's no way Joe Shane could go into this draft thinking I'm set at quarterback long term. Yeah. No, if he, he if he loves a if he loves a quarterback, he's he's 
we've known it all along. He's going to take one. It's obvious. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the flip side, we have, you and I have mentioned this a number of times. You can't just take one to take one. You yeah. can't just say, oh, well, you know what? We, we Daniel Jones is done. We need a quarterback. Up, oh, We're going to take the fifth best option. We're not really in love with the guy. <laughs> we need to replace Daniel Jones. You want to get rid of him next year, so we're just going to take the guy. And you do that, and guess what? In 2029, we're, we're doing the same thing again. Or 2028, maybe they don't pick up the fifth year. Whatever it is. Four or five years now, we're doing the same thing. We're having the same discussion. Because this yeah. has now come full circle here. Uh, we obviously <coughs> were not happy with the pick on draft night with good reason. The one thing I'll say is this. Between McCarthy, Penix, the, these guys that – the not that the Giants are going to take Penix at six, but I, I do think Penix's pro day really freaking helped him out. Um, Drake May. All these guys are huge prospects coming out of college and they were, they were big time prospects going into college and Daniel Jones was neither. So, but that's what always throws me off, Chris. Oh, JJ McCarthy came, you know, he played in an NFL type system in Michigan. That's fine, but he wasn't playing against NFL talent in Michigan, not against it. He had a lot of NFL talent around him, but he wasn't playing as much against it. And Daniel Jones also came from what they said. You know, he played in a pro style system. And he came from Cutcliffe and the Mannings and all this, and he's going to be the guy, and he's not the guy. So Joe Shane, tons of pressure to get it right. <laughs> Excuse me. Whatever he decides to do, tons and tons of pressure. Tons. This is this is it for him. Yeah. Big time. Huge, Big time. Huge, huge, huge decision. Step up huge to the decision. plate and knock it out of the park. He has to. Huge, huge decision. We'll we'll find out. We'll find out. But yeah, we we've been talking. I've been having a lot of fun. Let's say hello to some of the regulars in here. Alexander in the chat. Gi Zoe in the chat. Barbara in the chat. Thank you for popping in, Barbara. Joey in the chat. Uh, Dominic in the chat. What's going on? Prescott at twenty five. We'll talk about that. That was all over Twitter this week. What's up, Joseph? What's going on? Bold design. Papa Goots in the chat. Thank you to everybody. Delia, thank you for being here, man. Uh, and yeah, get to some of your super chats, man. But thank you to everybody for being here. Appreciate all you guys. What's up, Eddie? What's going on, Rob? What's going on, Samuel? Entertainer talking drugs. Yes, I'm starting a new channel, guys. What's going on? Neil in the chat. Simus in the chat. Thank you for be being here, guys. Who who's starting a new channel? There's a guy. There's a guy with a with a icon that says Entertainer talking drugs. So I said I might oh, start a new oh, channel. Yeah, he's he's been there though. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just kidding. Oh, just kidding. gotcha, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, let me get to a couple of these. Bluegrass, thank you, brother. Appreciate you, Brilly, Brilly. What up, man? Dog? What up, Bluegrass? My guy, Bluegrass. What up? Bluegrass, thank you. As Louis T would say, thank you for double up, uh, double up. Uh, uh. By the way, uh, for you people in the chat, I'm going to try to reach out to those guys uh, sometime here soon to see if maybe we can get one together for old time's sake and talk about the draft. Um, I don't know if that'll happen again. I'm hoping that we, we still have the channel. We still have the Super Friends channel. We have not defunct it, but we're not going to do it like every month. So maybe we just don't want that type of commitment, but that doesn't mean we can't do one once in a while. So we'll we'll see we'll see what's up. You know, maybe we can do one before the draft because it'll be interesting to see what Louis thinks. Washington pick in second, and you know where Law and Brunson want to go with their teams as well, and what they think about their off season. Not that Dallas had much of an off season. That's not yeah. bluegrass. Thank you, bro. Washington isn't taking JJ. Don't be a keto. <laughs> Damn keto cult people. Uh, Bluegrass. You'll never, you never know, Bluegrass. You, you never know. know. You don't know. It, uh, listen, it could be. I don't know why Washington would do it, though. Like, what does Washington have to gain from that? I, I don't they know. Might, they might. They might. I like McCarthy a lot more than you, so I'll be less shocked. But I still would be shocked. I'm not. I'm not predicting it. I'm not. I saw somebody say Tana Colt uh, McCarthy from the beginning. I got killed. I remember did a live stream in October. Uh, I said McCarthy could end up being a top five pick in this draft in October. People killed me for it. Uh, I did not think it was going to happen uh, as the season went along, but I wouldn't be stunned if Washington did it because I do think there's a lot of things to like with McCarthy, but they should not. I think well, I think Washington should go Drake May. I think I don't care about the system. I don't care. I think Drake May, his his ceiling is way too high. It's do you think they're a little high. 
Do you think there's shell shock from the last North Carolina quarterback that they had that they already traded away? <laughs> Sam Howell. No, but Drake may so much better than Sam Howell. They're not I even close to the I, You're not getting an argument from me, but I'm just saying, do you think that they stay away from that school because they literally just took one last year from that school? Uh... No, I don't think that I don't think that scares them away. But I, I just feel like knowing their offensive coordinator, Jaden Daniels just seems like the better fit. Yeah. You I know, mean, it's, but, it's like it, it, a lot of times that's that's what does it. Like you think about the 49ers back in uh, 2021 or whatever it was when they moved up to three. All reports came out that Shanahan wanted Mac Jones. And I think that's legitimate. I think he wanted Mac Jones because Mac Jones, he looked at as kind of like a Brock Purdy, a guy that would fit in his offense. Yep. And ownership kind of forced him to take Trey Lance. So I just I just think, I, even though I think I would much rather have May with the Giants than Jaden Daniels, personally. Everybody's entitled to their own opinions. And I, I, there's a lot of people that love Jaden Daniels. I think for Washington, he's the pick for them. I just think he fits their offense. He's going to fit what Kingsbury wants to do better than what Drake May will. And I think Drake May would fit what we want to do much better than what Jaden Daniels would. I, I agree. But I guess I don't know why these rumors would come out if they weren't legitimately interesting. Like, they have nothing to gain. Like, if the Giants were blowing smoke up someone's ass about taking them because they wanted somebody to jump ahead of them because Arizona's not taking a quarterback and Los Angeles isn't taking a quarterback, that's one thing. But if that pushes one of the wide receivers back to the Giants. But what does Washington have to gain from it? Because they're not trading out of the two pick. They're not going to go back too far. Because yeah. then they might miss out on a quarterback, and they literally just got rid of Sam Howell. Who, but they brought they bring in Brissett. Who did they who did they bring in as, as their quarterback? I forget. Brissett, they, they Brissett's brought, with New, with New England. Okay, who did they, they didn't they bring in a veteran guy? I can't remember. They must have. I don't remember off the top of my. But they yeah they brought in. Somebody, they're they're going quarterback. They didn't trade Sam Howell to not go quarterback. So I I guess I'm not saying they're taking JJ McCarthy. I just don't understand why that would even surface if there wasn't some interest. Because they have nothing. Oh, to Mario, Mariota. Somebody said. I think Mar that okay, is, who it is. Mar you, Mariota. You. Yeah. So, which is I a perfect was... pickup if you're going quarterback. Which they are clearly going quarterback. Washington even said it this week. They're going quarterback. Yeah, of course they are. But yeah, the only question is which quarterback. But if I'm doing, a, I'll do my mock right now, bad dog. This is if I was doing a mock today, Caleb, as we've both said all along, like back when people yeah. were throwing out these stupid rumors in January that they may keep Justin Fields, clearly going one to the Bears. Yeah. Um. Jaden Daniels to me is going to to Washington. I I don't care about the McCarthy. I even though I like Drake May better. I I I think Jaden Daniels is the pick there. And then at three, I I just can't, I can't picture. And maybe New England is throwing this stuff out there. And maybe maybe it's because they prefer one quarterback over the other. If you're Gerard Mayo, taking over that team. You don't know when you're going to get an opportunity to select a guy that you feel is an elite quarterback prospect again. Mm -hmm. I understand that they have so many holes there. You don't have to trade up to do it. I think New England's staying there. I don't think they trade out. I, I think they, they I think they take Drake May. That I think that's the first three picks. And then I think four is going quarter. I think I think JJ McCarthy's going four. I, I just don't know if it's going to be the Giants or Minnesota. But if you're um Whatchamacallit, if you're Arizona, I don't want to drop to 11. Right. I don't want to drop from 4 to 11. I don't care what you're offering me. I'm bypassing the opportunity to take Marvin Harrison Jr. if I drop from 4 to 11. So I'm of the thought process of, of if Minnesota wants to get to 4, I think they got to get to 6 first. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that, that it's going to come down to the Giants not wanting to move up to 4. Willing or 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 the Chargers, one of those teams, not wanting to get a quarterback and willing to move back and then jumping from that spot to four. Because if I if I'm Arizona, I'm not dropping to eleven. No, I wouldn't. I think they'd be fools to do that. Yeah, yeah. So you'd, you'd have to give, you'd have to give them so much. Like they're bypassing taking Marvin Harrison Jr. or neighbors if they're dropping seven spots to end up with who who are they ended up with there Roma Dunze is not going to be there even Brock Bowers probably right. won't be there Brock Bowers won't even be there right you're you're so missing like, out now now you're think, into now you're into the Xavier Worthy you're into the Xavier Leggett you're into the Lad McConkey and as good as those guys are they're not top 12 picks you, I guess at that point you're looking at a lineman you're looking at JC Latham as an edge you're looking at something but yeah I mean if if Minnesota traded 
13 and, and whatever, or I'm sorry, 11 and 23 for six. And then they went from six to four and they gave up six and they gave up next year's first. I mean, that's the way they could do it or next year's second or, 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 or the, or with the giants, they could go, we'll give you pick 11 and next year's first. And if right. you're the Giants, you're like, that's great. I get future draft capital. I'm able to move back to 11. I have more ammunition if I got to move up and get a quarterback or trade for a quarterback. Um, and then they could take six and 23 and jump to four. And then if you're the if you're Arizona, you're like, I get the 23rd pick and I still get Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors to slam dunk. I yep. just I can't see Arizona dropping all the way to 11. But yet. you have to think Minnesota's got a trade in place. Like, why would they have picked up 23 if they didn't feel that? Yeah, they definitely. Are doing something, yeah, and they wouldn't let Kirk Cousins walk. Yeah, I don't know who Kirk, I I don't know who Kirk Cousins' agent is. That man belongs in the Hall of Fame, boy. Well, One hundred eighty million dollars, incredible, incredible. Hey, that guy he belongs in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> He's amazing, amazing. <laughs> Big Moo, thank you, bro. He says, "Hey, boys, neighbors are Rome, and why? I love Rome." Bad though, you start, man. Uh, I like I said, these guys to me are one A and one B. Uh, you can put them in a hat, pick one. It's not going to bother me either way. I prefer Romo Dunze. I definitely watched more Washington. I watched every Washington football game uh, this year, and I watched a lot of them just because I like to watch Michael Penix. And I found Romo Dunze from watching them. Um, Romo Dunze is comp again. You can take comps with a grain of salt, but when you're comparing him to Devontae Adams. You're comparing him to Larry Fitzgerald. That's a pretty good company. He's a very big wide receiver. He's a tough physical wide receiver. He goes up and gets the 50-50 balls. He is what Kenny Galladay was supposed to be for us. The other thing that's underrated about Romo Dunze is he's not a burner, but he's not slow. I mean, he's a 4-5 guy. C.D. Lamb's a 4-5-2 guy. He, 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 ran a four, he ran a 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, it was like a 4-4-5 four, four, or something. 4-4-5, four, four, okay. C.D. Lamb is, a, is, you know... Four five two. You're gonna tell me, oh, CD Lamb sucks because he runs a four five two. Romo Dunze is really good after the catch. He's tough to bring down in the open field. He's a big guy. He's a big target. He'd be a big red zone target. It's something that <laughs> the Giants really haven't had. That's why they brought in Galladay was to give yeah. Daniel Jones a big target in the end zone. That's why they brought in Darren Waller so that they could get him a big target in the red zone. I just really like Romo Dunze, and I like his work ethic. I've brought this up a number of times. He kind of didn't do the, the cone drill the way he wanted to do it, and he stayed after and worked on it. You can't yeah. put – you can't – it's just an intangible. Romo Dunze is awesome. Romo Dunze is awesome. Um, and he would be the number one wide receiver in probably eight out of every ten draft classes. Yeah. That's how strong this draft class is. Roma Dunze is awesome when you watch him. He's more than Kenny Galladay. Like, he's a yeah, much yeah. better route, route runner than Kenny Galladay. I agree, like, from a contested catch standpoint, similar in that sense. But he's he's more athletic than Kenny Galladay was, even at his best. He's, he's faster than Kenny he's Galladay. He's faster. Yeah. Galladay was pretty fast. I actually looked up his 40 time the other day. I was surprised it was 4-5. I thought it was going to be lower uh, while, while he was at the combine because a lot of people have compared Galladay uh, to Roma Dunze. But, um yeah, he's he's just a much more polished receiver than Galladay. But I'm a neighbors guy. Uh, I'm I'm a neighbors guy. I, and I, and it's not really a knock on uh, on uh, Roma Dunze, who's great. But for me, neighbors like the 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 biggest argument I hear people use when they when they prefer a Dunze to neighbors is they say the contested catch rate. Neighbors, go watch his film, watch his highlights. This guy has a ton of contested catches. The guy could jump out of the gym. He's it's not like he's a he's not like he's a midget. He's six foot. Right. Six foot. He could go up, he could go up and catch the ball. So um I, I think neighbors is I'm not gonna say he's as equipped because the three inches does matter, but neighbors is not this That's what like she said. Yeah. <laughs> he's not like this strictly slot wide receiver. He's definitely a guy that could line up on the outside. Yeah make contested catches. I just think neighbors is a, is a better fit for today's NFL. I think he's even, in a, even though I, I have to go Harrison, I think he's so good, yeah, but I think he's, he's even, he's a better fit than Harrison for today's NFL. Like that's what teams are looking for. That guy that has enough height that could still line up outside that could still make contested catches, but has enough breakaway ability in terms of strength in the open field to break a slant to the house. He's got the top end speed, not necessarily Tyree kill speed, but he's got, 
speed where he could, you know, take it to, you know, like a Jalen Hyatt, but he also has the size and the strength. Um, so for me, uh, it's neighbors. And uh, even though I really like Roma Dunze and I've talked myself into being like, he's closer than I thought he was. I'm still clearly a neighbors guy. Um, I have MHJ one though, but, uh, Neighbors is a close two. Neighbors is really. I'd be thrilled if we got neighbors. I'd be yeah. thrilled if we got a Dunes too, though. I don't want anybody to think I don't like a Dunes. I do, but neighbors is above them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I I'm not gonna be upset. Either one of those guys would look good in blue to me. I, I, don't, I don't. They're both elite talents. And yeah, we we have not we haven't had not since Beckham. We have not had an elite talent here. So, um, and we really lost the only elite talent we had on offense, which was Barkley. So now we really need, uh, you know, not that Barkley was a playmaker he was his rookie season, but he's better than anything else he had. So the Giants need that guy. They need that guy that can open up the field. They need defenses to focus on one of the wide receivers to open it up for Wandale Robinson, who if you get a guy like a neighbors or a Roma Dunze that can stretch the field or, you know, take the focus off the other guys. You got to look and say, we got to double this guy. Or we got to take this guy to the game and it allows a guy like Wandale to work underneath. We've seen how good Wandale Robinson was last year. It was amazing. Yep. If you have that open and then you have Hyatt on the other side, that is a, an absolute burner and can really stretch a field. And he's your deep threat where you got a complete receiver like an Odunze or a neighbor's to go with Wandale, to go with Jalen Hyatt, who still, you know, has some developing to do, but it, you can't teach the speed that Hyatt has. And we saw flashes of Jalen Hyatt being really good. The Giants wide receiver core all of a sudden looks pretty formidable. Now, yeah, they got to get a quarterback that can throw him the ball, and we got to get a line that can protect the quarterback so they can throw him the ball. But a guy like that gets guys open quicker. Yeah, And if you got a guy like Roma Dunze and Lake Neighbors, these guys that can create separation, you got a guy that, you know, I'm just going to throw it up to him when he's going to catch the ball, you can get rid of it quicker. Now, I don't know if Daniel Jones can do that because I just feel like he's just so locked into not processing fast enough. But maybe he can. Maybe he just looks out there like the guy's wide open throwing over there. The guy, I mean, we've seen this a million times. The best receivers are wide open. How many times did Jalen Hurts just turn around and throw the damn ball to A.J. Brown? Guy yeah. right now, it don't matter. A.J. Brown catching a damn ball all the time because yeah. it was seen. He's Debo Samuel. You know, that's why I like Romo Dunes. I think Romo Dunes is that type of – like he's a box-out guy. Where you box the guy out, he's so big, you can't really get over the top of him. But I'll be very happy with either one of them. <laughs> of course. I, I, any, any one of those wide receivers, I'd be thrilled. I, 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 think, I think any one of those three are – I would be surprised if any – they all don't turn out to be legitimate number one wide receivers in the NFL. Like I, I think they're all that good, so – I'd be thrilled with any one of the three. So at that point, you say to yourself, we got our weapons now. Like, like we could add another tight end for the future down the line, whatever. But we've got a legitimate young up and coming wide receiving core at that point. If you, if we were to end up with one of those yeah. three with one down. Yeah, they, exactly. The they're all very young. All of yeah. them. Yeah. Wondell is going into his third year, right? And Jalen yeah. Hyde's going into his second. We'd have a, they'd be a very young wide receiving mm -hmm. core. Listen, if for, uh, somehow Marvin Harris had ever ended up with the Giants, I might need to change my shorts. I don't know. I, just, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to believe it if that – like, I, I don't even mention him because I just don't think it's possible. I think it is possible. I think it is possible. I, not likely, but I, I would I would have told you no no chance it's possible uh, two weeks ago, three yeah. weeks ago. But if I'm of the thought now that four quarterbacks are going in the first four picks, and if we're not one of those teams that's taking a quarterback – all it takes is for Jim Harbaugh, who clearly loves the offensive line, to take Joe Alt or to take Malik Neighbors, which it's not crazy to me that he that he may prefer Malik Neighbors. Like, he's that good. So I do think it's possible that Marvin Harrison could fall to us if four quarterbacks go in the first four picks, well, which listen, is insane. In 2019, we didn't think Josh Allen would get there, and he did, no, and we didn't take him. And Jacksonville, right after us, said, thank you. Jacksonville, yeah. ran, Jacksonville ran up the podium. You and I weren't even finished ranting, and they had taken Josh Allen. They no. probably they probably sitting there. What the? Are you serious? <laughs> Take him. Thank you. <laughs> Who knows? But if if Marvin Harrison gets to the Giants on draft night, I I think Chris and I'd be pretty happy about that. I think a lot of Giants fans would be really happy about that if if he ended up here. Yeah. Uh, That'd be pretty amazing. Uh, ENA, we got some. Hey, long time. Let's see, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Thank you. He says, what up, fellas? Hope all has been well. I like Javon Baker. 
uh, Frank Gore Jr. and Dylan Lawball in the later rounds. I've really got to the later rounds because I'm so focused on number six right now. I I just that pick is so that pick is so important for us. I, I I'll focus on 47, you know, 70 later in the draft. It, it also depends on what we do at six yeah. and and which direction they go. But I, we mentioned Chris Jenkins, like. Again, mock drafts. What you know, the draft. I love. Sorry. I love Chris Jenkins. Not, at, not a mock uh, draft. I'm sorry, draft simulators. You take them with a grain of salt. You know, they're they're AI, so they don't know. Okay, but every mock I did had Chris Jenkins getting a seventy, and I took him every time. There's no. He, I, I I I maybe in the mocks. I don't think there's any. Chance I don't think there is either. But yeah, if if you know, that'd be that'd be. I would love to have him uh, in day three if he got that far. Chris, Jan- Chris oh, Jenkins, He's to me, me I, I would love him at 47. If if the Giants took him at 47, I'd be thrilled that we took Chris Jenkins. I think he's a perfect, not saying he's going to be as good as him, because Leonard Williams is a damn good football player, but he's that type of player. Like, and, and the Giants could use a player like that, right? They're trying to build this pass rush as good as they can. You had a player like Chris Jenkins to that line, like, yeah, I'd be excited if we got him. Uh, and again, I'm another. I'm a big Braylon Trice guy, another Washington guy at 47. Great edge rusher, motor that doesn't stop. And again, maybe it's just the way these guys are coached, but Washington's a lot of hardworking guys, and I just feel like that goes a long way in the NFL. You get there on talent, but everybody at that level is is super talented, and the guys that work the hardest are the ones that succeed at that level. You can't just get there and go, ah, well, you know, I'm just going to rest and rest my laurels. And those are the guys that fall out of the NFL fast because got to work. And I like Trice there, I, but I wouldn't be mad at that. I wouldn't be mad at Cooper Beebe if they wanted to beef up the offensive line. There's a lot of ways they could go at 47. They yeah. could double up a wide receiver if they chose to do that, depending on they who could. they at 47. You know, I don't think Xavier Leggett would end up at 47. I also don't think Ladd McConkey would end up at 47. But – you never know. That's somebody's why, gonna, that's why somebody, the, somebody's gonna end up at 47 that we don't expect because yeah. Zizel Jalari we didn't think was gonna get there. We didn't think McKinney was gonna get there. So right. there's always a player or two that drops that you're of like, course. how is this guy still available? Like it's gonna happen. And that's why you gotta tune in on draft night because you never know what you're <laughs> getting from Chris and I. You never know the reactions that are coming. It's it's uh gonna be good. Manny, thank you, bro. Uh by the way, Deuce Isaiah Hartenstein. Best Knicks team in 30 years. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm I don't know about that. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, know about, about the. Th- I don't know about the 30 years, but 25 uh, years, not 30. <laughs> I'm gonna be call. I'll be calling the playoff games. I'm. I'm gonna do that. So that'll be fun. But uh, yeah, Deuce McBride has been uh, unbelievable. I, I, the last like five games where he's gotten minutes, he's played great. And the Knicks took back the third seed last night. So the the only thing with the Knicks now is is can. Uh, can they get healthy? Can, you know, can on an, is on an OB and Julius Randall because you you gotta I, you gotta think you want them back at least two or three games before the end of the regular season so they could get their legs under them a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, if they get the three seed, that's huge because that makes it so you could avoid Boston until the Eastern Conference Finals. But yeah, um, this Knicks team that's, has been so fun fun this year. That's so fun the only year. team in the East that I look at and go, I don't know if the Knicks can beat them in in seven. I, I think the Knicks could take Boston to seven. I just don't they they I think they can beat Milwaukee. I think they can beat any team in the East, but I'm not saying they can't beat the Celtics, but I think the Celtics would be that would be tough. Well, if, if, if they could beat the Celtics, you're telling me they could win the NBA championship because yeah, the Celtics exactly. are the best team in the NBA, in my opinion. So um well, yeah, there's a couple so, of teams in the West that are really freaking good because well, the, the Nuggets Eastern, yeah, the Eastern Conference is not nearly as good as the Western Conference. Uh the Nuggets are really good, the Timberwolves are really good. Um, so the, the team at the top of the West are really good. The Thunder are really good, but I think they're inexperienced, and I, I don't think they could get out of the West. But the Nuggets are defending champions, and yeah. they're a very big team, and they're all really good shooters. They're clutch. They're well, caught. that that's a complete team. So it'll be interesting. The playoffs are always, always fun. But yeah, I think that um, I think I think the Knicks can beat anybody in the East. I just think Boston. I. I if somebody could eliminate Boston for them, and they, I think the Knicks could go to the finals, especially if they're healthy. Maybe, maybe Miami gives them a series. They're they're always a pesky team in the playoffs. You never maybe, know. Maybe Spolstra gives them a series. You never know. Yeah, they're Spolstra's been there, so he he knows yeah. how to knows how to coach. But listen, man, I I gotta you gotta give the Knicks front office some credit because 
for 25 years, pretty much. Every move they made was absolute shit. And the moves that they've made recently, the trade for Ananobi, the signing of Brunson, bringing in a guy like Isaiah, Isaiah Hartenstein, a Josh Hart, these guys fit perfectly. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like throwback six basketball. They always won with defense. I forgot. Yeah. I think they might have lost the game, but there was one. I think it was against the Sixers. They it was a game that was like seventy nine to seventy four. And I know that, that that's totally a nineteen ninety three New York Knicks game. <laughs> the Knicks had four games, I think, in a row, if I'm not mistaken, where they held their opponent. They held their opponent. Yeah, ninety points. Yes, which that's unheard of. Uh, in, in this day, NBA. Yeah, that's unheard of. So. Uh, yeah, pretty cr- Yeah, I'm looking at it now 74, 79, 79, oh, 93. Okay, so close enough. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they're, yeah, the, the Knicks, are, I mean, they've also slowed down the tempo with all their stars out. So they, that's, they, they know that's how they, you know, it gives them the best chance to win. But yeah, their defense has been great this year. Yeah. yeah. So again, that's kind of old school Knicks basketball. Danny, thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Drafting thoughts and drafting Spencer Rattler in the fourth round. Let him sit for a year. Would you draft that? He's not making it to the fourth round. He won't make it. Probably not. Yeah, I think he, I, I, I'm i leaning. He'll be a third round, maybe late second round pick. But, yeah, I, I don't think he gets to the fourth round. I don't think he gets to the fourth round. He could. I mean, I mean quarterbacks drop, but I, 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 I'm I not projecting. I'm saying I'm going to go third round. I think Rattler goes in the third round. Yeah. I think Rattler could even go late in the second round. I think he he's could. a guy. I, I think he's a guy that is going to go for higher than people think he's going to go. Um, But. I mean, yeah, if the Giants are taking quarterback and Spencer Rattler was there in the fourth round, I don't see why they wouldn't. They're going to take a quarterback at some point, and there's no financial obligation. If he sucks, he sucks. So, yeah, yeah. Spencer Rattler. I like Spencer Rattler personally. I don't like him in the first – I don't like him in the third. I wouldn't take him at 70. But if he's there on day three in the fourth round and the Giants want to take him there, yeah, well, I wouldn't have a problem with it. He's, he's, got, he's got some talent, you know, so – I wouldn't have a problem. I just don't think he's going to get to day three. I, I think he's going to go somewhere between 55 and 75. As, as that's, far as yeah, that. that's probably where I have him. I've seen Anthony ask this a bunch. What do you guys think of Joel Milton quarterback? I saw somebody, somebody asked me that. Actually, no, I think it was Tommy G posted and I commented on it. Um, Joe Milton to me is the happy Gilmore of quarterback prospects. <laughs> he, he literally has, he's like a guy yeah, that wins long drive for show. Pump he, wins, he wins long drive competitions. He can't putt. He has no short game. He has no technique. He is the happy Gilmore of quarterback prospects. That's who uh, Joe Milton is. Um, but listen, if uh, if if Brian Dable feels that he's, uh, you know, uh, he could be, uh, what's his name, uh, the Carl Weathers' character in that movie, if he feels he could be him and fix uh, happy Gilmore, why yeah. not? Take a shot. Yeah, Chubbs. Chubbs, yeah, there oh. you go, Chubbs. <laughs> Manny, thank you, bro. Also, I guarantee this is what's happening. Cards trade out to a team that wants J.J. McCarthy. First four picks, quarterbacks. Giants take Marvin Harrison Jr. and neighbors book it. I, I would love Mar. I, I just can't see Marvin Harrison Jr. getting there. But if he did, the Giants should run up to the freaking podium to take Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, we sure. can't, in my opinion, we can't lose in our situation. If we love no. a quarterback, we have, we're in a great spot to be able to trade up to get one. If we don't, we're going to get a player that should not go at six. So we're in a good spot. We're in a really good spot. And I'm not going to be upset if no matter what they do with that pick, I'm not going to be upset as long as they don't take uh Bo Nicks, like you said, but um, I, which obviously is not going to happen, but um, yeah, I, it's going to be very hard to see me flip out on draft night. Very hard. Cause unlike you, I actually like JJ McCarthy. I don't love the idea. I, of I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to flip out. I'm just not going to be happy about it. I'm yeah, you're going to be like, eh, you're going to be like, uh, I don't know, risk. And, I, and I'm and i going to think it's risky, too, if they do that. I'm going to think, to be honest with you, let's be real. It's risky taking any of these quarterbacks. Yeah. That's just the reality of the situation. It's, 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 it's risky, especially yeah. with the team we currently have. It, it's risky. But if you love a quarterback, you do it. But um, I'm not flipping out on draft night. I don't think I'm going to be flipping out no matter what Joe Shane decides to do. I'm going to support. If he support takes Bo Nix at six, I'm flipping Bo it. Nicks, Bo Nix, yeah, Bo Nix. I wouldn't flip out with Alt. Not that I want him to do it, but I wouldn't flip out. I'd be pissed uh, off if they took Joe Alt. I, most Giant fans would. I, I wouldn't be pissed, but I, it's not my ideal pick. Um, and I don't not expect it. No, I don't expect it. David, thank you, bro. If there was any doubt, Drake may would fall past three. I think he put that to bed in this pro day, but they all play well in the pro day. 
I don't. Th- I don't put any stock. I don't put any stock in the pro days. I, I. I. I just don't like. And I, I. I don't know. Like pro days are fun, and you get to see them throw. First off, they're all in a dome. They're in a controlled environment. They're in shorts. They're in the draft though, the the uh, combine. I mean. Yeah. The, the com- Yeah. You're right. I. I don't know. I just. I don't put much. Th- I don't. I think Drake May was going high with or without the pro day today. I. I, I think Penix it. helped this stock because he didn't run the forty at the combine. He ran the forty at his pro day. He and might have. He ran a sub four or five. Yeah, because everybody knew he could throw. I mean, he he was the best guy at the combine. He threw the best of the combine. I mean, he was the guy. He was the show. So, yeah. but he didn't run. So the fact he ran his pro day, and the, I don't think he did a vertical either. And he, his vertical was thirty six and a half. It just shows you the athleticism he has, even after tearing his ACL twice. Um, I think it did help his stock for those I, well, people. I, I, for a quarterback like Penix, yeah, I think it could help yeah, the stock. May though, yeah, I don't think May May's not going to number one. Yeah, with like like like, like for uh, like like for Daniel Jones, it helped his stock. Daniel Jones had a really good pro day. I remember that. Like people were talking about it. It obviously helped his stock. He went from a guy. I actually went back and looked because I was curious. Everybody always says that nobody had Daniel Jones going in the first round. That's not true. Uh, like a week before the draft, not um, six. <laughs> yes, go back and look. What's his name? Um, uh, Daniel Jeremiah had the Giants taking him with the sixth pick, like a week before the draft. Uh, the uh, the other uh, Mel Kiper had him had him going seventeenth to the Giants. Both of them had him the Giants taking him. Uh, one had him at six, one had him at seventeenth. But yeah, most people didn't have it six. But I his pro day, pro day certainly helped Daniel Jones. He had a great pro day and he moved up because of it. So I agree, it could help a guy like Penix. For me, May May was going top. Five, regardless, what no matter what he did at his pro day, like we all know he's got a big arm. We all, you know, so yeah, I don't know. No surprises here. Yeah, no surprises. E Luca, thank you, bro. Trade back with Denver, pick swap Pat Sertain and possibly Denver's 20, 2025 first round pick. Denver may not want to pay him. Draft Murphy or B Thomas, wide receiver at 12 home run, in my opinion. Who's B. Thomas, a wide receiver. I'm trying to Brian think. Brian Thomas, he, the LSU dude. Oh, yeah. he, he's the other. Yeah, he's the other. Yeah, he's good. He's he's a top four. Or five, probably top. Well, my, no, no. Well, I mean, I mean, I guess, but I not not what not what I'm hoping for. Um, no, I if we traded back to twelve, I mean Bowers, if he if he were to fall there, I'd like. Um, I mean, I would pray a Dunes would fall, even though he wouldn't. Um, I'd be open to a tackle at that point. I'd be open to, a, uh, you know, if we traded that far back, I'd be open to a tackle. I'd be open to a corner. Like there's so many things you could do with 12. There's so many things you could do with 12, but if we're going to trade back to 12, I'd sooner, I I'd rather take the wide receiver with our second round pick. I think because you're not, yeah, you're not that, getting, that means. you're not getting that elite wide receiver prospect. There's right, still plenty of really means, good man. ones. Yeah. Yeah, but, I agree with you. Yeah. I, I also would, I'd also rather just trade back in Minnesota and get their first two first round picks as opposed to just number 12 and certain I, I wouldn't I don't know we'll see so definitely something I never consider was trading with Denver I I don't know why Denver would trade up they they're not going to trade to six and get McCarthy so I don't I don't know what Denver would be unless they're trying to trade up to get the wide receiver that the Giants would want and if the Giants really like Malik neighbors and Romo, or Romo Dunze I don't see them trading out to 12 either. So I, the more I think about it, the more I don't want the Giants to trade back. I really like the, like the only way I would even entertain trading back, I think, or that I want them to entertain trading back is if you're getting a future first. Like, yeah. it, like if you're trading back to 11 and Minnesota and you're like, OK, Minnesota is probably not going to be good next year. They're going to be starting J.J. McCarthy. We get a top 10 pick next year along with the 11th pick. OK, I get it. You might be taking a quarterback the following year. You want as much ammunition as you could get. I get that. But if you're not getting a future first, these prospects are too good, man. You can't, you you can't, you would get, like if, if Marvin Harrison Jr. turns out to be what I think he's going to be, like I think he's going to be top three or four receiver in the league. If he turns out to be that, Joe Shane will get killed yeah. if he if he trades back to 11 and, and we end up with a, I, I don't think so, man. I think the prospects are too good. I don't think we're trading back. The, the only thing is, like you said, if you get a future first, that's and the next year, and then next year you say, okay, well now we, if we need a quarterback, we're definitely going quarterback. We have two first round picks. We can maneuver however we want to and get Cam Ward or Shadow Sanders or Ewers or what you know, whoever the the guys are coming out. 
Um, I'm a big Cam Ward fan. I actually bet him to win the Heisman next year already. I, I thought that if Cam Ward came out this year, he would have been the fifth best quarterback uh, out there. So, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll see. Uh, big move. They read a member for 19 months. He said, play it. You got it, big move. You got, you got it, bro. bro. Thank you. Rose says, thank you for being a friend. Rose from the Golden Girls. My kid was at Target with his mom, and he, she called me. <laughs> she said, who's your favorite Golden Girl? Or he said, "Who, Daddy, who's your favorite grandma? Because he calls them the grandmas. Daddy watching the grandmas. Yeah, Daddy likes grandma. Who's your favorite? I said Rose. So he got me there Rose. You go. There got you go. Rose. Akuna King, thank you for being a member, bro. Could uh, boys trade Dak? And two firsts for a t I can't see that. Dak's making too much money. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't see that. If you're picking that high in the draft, why would you? Why would you want? Why would you want? Dak. Dak, why, would you want why would you want Dak Prescott? You want? You want? You want a guy in rookie contract? Yeah, on a rookie contract. So no. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Giants fans have been bringing that up on Twitter uh, this past week. Like, if the Giants don't go quarterback in this draft, which is certainly. A strong possibility, in my opinion. Like, I'm not, I, I'm kind of, I don't know what the hell they're going to do. I honestly have no idea. But if Ugh. they don't go quarterback in this draft, fans are like, well, unless Daniel Jones plays out of his mind, you're, you're probably moving on the following year. Is Dak Prescott to the Giants a possibility? No. And the only way it becomes even a remote possibility is the Giants would have to actually have a pretty good year because if they were picking top seven or eight, I think you're going for a quarterback in the draft. Like, you're trading up, you, you know, whatever. But, if if they're picking twenty, but then if they're picking twenty, I think it's more likely you probably stay with Jones if he has a good year. Right. So I don't know. I just don't see the, I don't see the Dak thing, man. I don't want Dak Prescott, man. I don't want Dak Prescott. Well, listen, started. all these people. Yeah, I was gonna say, Chris. Everyone's like, oh, don't take panic. She's old. He's twenty three. Dak yeah. is what thirty two. Yeah, he's making a ton of yeah. Dak to the Giants ain't gonna happen. Dak will get destroyed with this team. Dak can't succeed on that team. Dak Press, yeah, Dak Prescott has had uh, collectively throughout the course of his career as, as good as good of a support system as any quarterback has had in the league. Yeah, like o overall, I'm not saying he, every year he's had the best, but right. overall, from the line, 20, Zeke Elliott, Prime, yeah. Des yeah. Bryant, C.D. Lamb, Amari right. Cooper. Come on, man. And he's got two playoff wins, and uh, one, and I think they both came to teams with like a 500 record. Yeah, like I don't know, man. I'm not. I'm not. I don't want Dak. I don't want to pay Dak 50 million dollars as a free agent. No, I'm not doing that. Not doing. That. I have no interest in that. No way. And Blue he's a cowboy. Right. I don't want him. I don't want yeah. him. Blue Bluegrass, thank you, bro. To me, Daniels is quarterback one. The next round of Cunningham. We'll see. You know, when I did the video about. Washington taking JJ McCarthy number two, and what he meant for the Giants. I was curious what Washington fans thought about it, and they all said, "Hell no, hell no, I don't want JJ McCarthy. Hell no, hell no, I don't want McCarthy. No way, no how." So I'm like, well, "I'm not the only one that feels that way." Um, my some people, some people obviously do, but it seems like the majority of people like don't want, <laughs> don't want him. In the top six. So somebody's going to get him in the top six. Like Minnesota, like Minnesota makes perfect sense for him. Perfect. That's Who? a perfect. Jaden Daniels? McCarthy. Oh, McCarthy. Yeah. yeah. That's why they want him. Yeah. I think he makes perfect sense for Minnesota. And I think I think Daniels is going to be Washington commander. I'd be surprised if he's not. I, I, I really think Washington's taking Jaden Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, thank you, bro. Do you think Jones will be able to get ball the number one receiver? If uh, here's what I'll say, Chris. We're gonna find out if we take one. Yeah, and, and here's what I'll say, Bad Dog. If he can't, we're gonna find a quarterback who can. Right. So, you know, it's like maybe just, Drew Lock can. Yeah, maybe Drew Lock can, but just because we take Marvin Harrison doesn't mean that Daniel Jones is gonna be the guy throwing to Marvin Harrison for the rest of right. his career. Marvin right. Harrison is 21 years old, man. So um if he can't, yeah. we will find a quarterback who could get it to him. I promise yeah. you that. Yeah, the, the wide receiver will be around a lot longer than Jones will be. Yeah. That's maybe Cam maybe Cam Ward is a guy that throws to him next year. Maybe Shador Sanders is a guy that throws to him next year. 
Maybe Daniel Jones is the guy that throws to him next year. You don't know. But we got to take a number one wide receiver to find out. I still think the Giants are doing that. I, I, in my heart of hearts, do believe they're going wide receiver. Air buddy, thank you. What's your plan if Jones gets hurt and we own $47 million next year? I don't think you can risk playing this guy even a small amount of games a season. It's so confusing. I think, I think Patty said it was. We asked Patty. I think she said it was like an. I don't think it was that much. I I think it was like I don't remember. But it was it was more obviously. I think it was like I don't remember. She said it was like twelve million extra than what they yeah. would have to. Either so way, like he would be four million. Yeah, he would be back on the team next year if he got hurt. Unless, well, I guess you could do a post June first cut and split, split the. Yeah, that's probably what they would do. They'd probably do. That's what they would do. If he was 30, if he, let's say it was a $35 million hit, if he got hurt and like tore his ACL again, they would probably cut him. They would say, okay, we'll take the $17.5 million hit this year and we'll take the $17.5 million hit in uh, the, uh, 2026 at that point when the cap's yeah. going to be like $300 million or right. over $300 million. So that's probably what they would do. I, I think if, I don't think it's nearly as catastrophic as people are making it out to be. I think if Jones got hurt and tore his ACL, yeah, it sucks. You're on the hook for like twelve million more or whatever it was against the cap, but they would do a post June first cut and they just split it evenly over the next two years. I think that's what would happen. Yeah, I think Jones I, is going to play if, if we don't draft the quarterback in the first round. I think he's going to play. Yeah, I I mean, unless too. he's hurt, unless he can't, unless he's really hurt. But yeah. Colby, thank you, bro. Do you guys have any upcoming drafts, hot takes not involving the Giants? I don't even know if I have a hot take involving the Giants. I, my hot take all time is Brock Bowers to Los Angeles at five. That was I, I I gave you my hot take, Colby, in January, and now it's not a hot take. <laughs> my hot take was McCarthy. I always thought McCarthy was gonna go much higher than what they were saying. So my hot take now, um mm. the Washington takes JJ McCarthy. I don't think they're gonna though. I think Jaden Daniels is going there. That's a hot take. All right, here, here's my hot take. I don't know if this is considered a hot take either. I I I absolutely think Jim Harbaugh is taking Joe Alt. I am 100 percent convinced that the Chargers are taking Joe Alt. And I respect the hell out of Jim Harbaugh for doing it. <laughs> but and I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is a giant, and we can all that, rejoice and celebrate. That's what I think, man. I I think Joe Walt's gonna be the fifth pick to the Chargers. I real I really believe that. Like you look at the way that he built that Michigan football team. Uh, he, he's all about the trenches. He's all about the offensive line. Um, yeah, I think I think he's starting from the ground up. He's building that line, and then he's gonna worry about the wide receivers. I I, I think they're taking Joe Walt. I really do. And then they got Slater. They got Alt. You got Herbert. And you got something there, right? So that, that's what that's what I think is gonna happen. I think Joe Alt's going fifth. I hope you're right, because then MHJ could be a giant and be very happy with that. That that'd be a fact. And I can tell you this, I'm not a, not about to buy any freaking jerseys for the giant skirt players anymore. It's not happening. I lost I, the last two I bought both ended up off the team this year. So not not happening. The guys that were giants that retired giants, different story. No. Gavin, thank you, bro. Jim Harbaugh just said JJ the best pro day ever. He should draft him and trade us Herbert. That's what I said earlier. I, I said the same thing. You love him so much, draft him and give us Justin Herbert. I'm okay with that. I'd be good. Yeah, I mean, uh, we'll see, Gavin. Um, I'm not surprised Jim Harbaugh said that, though. Jim Harbaugh has been hyping J.J. McCarthy going back to, like, November. He was saying that he was the best quarterback in the country. So that's his guy. He loves him. So I'm not surprised by that, man. I'm. Uh, yeah, he's been praising him from the start. So I'm not, that's his guy. Yeah, I I agree. I agree with that. I just don't know. <laughs> it would be interesting. And, and I see a lot of people disagreeing with the – it's a hot take for a reason. You're not supposed to agree with it. Right, me. exactly. Hot <laughs> but takes I, but, but, but very, yeah, that, none. that's my hot take, man. I, I think Joe Alt's going to the Chargers at five. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, the hot take, yes. Yeah, I, take. I, be, yeah be, I hope you're right. JJ, yeah. thank you, bro. Marvin Harrison at six. Uh, MP3 at 47 or trade up. Who's MP3? MP3, MP. Oh, Michael Penix, maybe. Michael he's Penix Jr. Jr. No, he's not, he's not the third. He's the second. Michael Penix Jr. Yeah. He's not going to go 47, but listen, my my dream scenario was Romo Dunze and Michael Penix. 
that was that was my dream scenario. Penix's pro day put him in the first round, at least maybe top half. Maybe he ends up in Denver. I mean, that that could happen. Maybe he ends up with the Raiders. That could also, which would make my brother-in-law very happy because he's a big Michael Penix guy as well. Um, I never know Pen- I Pen- Penix is the wild card for me. Like, I have no idea where he's going to go in the draft. Like, I, I literally have no I, 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 He's one of those guys I could see going 12 to Denver. Or I could see him going like mid to late second round. Like I, I have no idea where Penix is going to go. I have, I'm yeah, because quarterback quarterbacks are hard to pinpoint once you get out of like the obvious. They top. are because if one or two teams passes on him that need a quarterback, he's going to fall. So I don't well, know. Let him, is- fall, let him fall at forty seven. I mean, <laughs> happier to pick and slop to take that guy at forty seven. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to uh, predict where he's going. Uh, how? Go. I mean, that'd be the greatest thing ever. Because yeah. you have a very low risk, extremely high reward because there's no, you're not paying him anything at 47. And, you know, if anything ever happened, you move on from him in a year and you lost nothing. Yeah. Was not. so, I just, I, 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 I'm not saying he, he, like maybe he goes to the Raiders. I just don't think Penix is, I don't think he's an ideal fit for a Sean Payton offense. Like he, to me, he doesn't scream Drew Brees. So, I, I don't think Denver's going Penix. That's my guess. I could see Denver going Bo Nix actually before Penix, just because of fit, not because I think Bo Nix is a better quarterback. Um, never know. You yeah, never know. But, but I, I don't think Penix will go to Denver. I, maybe the Raiders. That's possible. I mean, uh, let's just face it. Denver has done pretty lousy with quarterbacks. Brock yeah. Osweiler, Drew yeah. Locke didn't pan out over there. They bring in Russell Wilson. That was a complete disaster. So ever since the Peyton Manning thing, uh, they have really struggled with yeah, Tim Tebow. <laughs> he really, they really struggled there uh, with the quarterback position. Joshua, thank you, bro. May reminds me of Josh Allen with his raw talent. Well, that's why he'd be a good fit for the Giants. Yeah, and and I see uh, Owen says wasn't Breeze a pocket passer? Yeah, he was, but Breeze was more of a Penix is more of a guy that wants to you know throw the ball down the field like he's he's a to me Peyton's more of the the quick and intermediate game that's what Breeze was all about right like getting the ball out quick slants boom boom I don't think he do that though he can he can offense was set up to throw the ball deep yeah if you you damn you talk about arm strength and zip on the ball and getting that ball into a tight window Penix can do that as I I, yeah I'm not I'm not saying he's not capable of doing that I just don't think I don't think that's the ideal offense for him but yeah, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a coach. But well, that, we're gonna find, we're yeah. gonna find out. Right? We're gonna, we we're, gonna, we're, gonna we're gonna we're gonna find out. That's why the draft is so much fun. A lot of surprises. A lot a lot of yep, we knew that. But tons more of holy shit. Can you believe that? That's why it's fun. Yeah. Tuto, grazie, my friend. Grazie, massive selects the bad dog and Tana. and all Dia Giants fans across the pond. And please. Slap the stinky boys, losers, and F all the ex Giants players. Flip to the boys. Just talking about Saquon. Good to see you, Tudo, man. Hope you're doing well. And, ah, man, Saquon's, Saquon's dead to us, man. He's an eagle, man. That's all there is to it. You got to turn my back. <laughs> he's an eagle. You're done. Got to turn my back on him. I, I love a guy who says to me, and it, I mean, it's the videos I did still get comments, which, you know, I did those videos two weeks ago, but. Guys, like I love how people think Miles Sanders is good for us. He was, he was good for you guys. I, I, he ran for over a thousand yards. I mean, my whole point with Barkley was I don't know. Philadelphia did not collapse because their running game was no good. That was the whole point. They collapsed for other reasons, and now there's no Kelsey there. I just don't think Saquon Barkley puts them over the hump. Like, oh, that's the guy we needed to win a Super Bowl. They're yeah. were there are a couple of years removed. Last year they were not close to being a Super Bowl team. Yeah. And there was yeah. a lot of turmoil in that locker room. Who the hell knows? Uh Barkley's Bar- gonna do well. Bar- Barkley's gonna do well there, but I agree with you that he doesn't have the impact on right. that offense that like an AJ Brown did. Right. Like like you could stick a decent runner back there, and they're still gonna be very effective with that offensive line yeah. for the Eagles. Yeah. I don't think that he makes them like an elite team. He, he's an upgrade, but how much of an yeah. upgrade? You know, people yeah. are like, oh, well, the Giants, everybody had a construct. And say, I understand that, but with the Eagles, I you 
<laughs> the Eagles were always better when they ran the ball anyway. But Jalen Hurts also runs the ball a lot. And Barkley's not a 30-carry a game guy. I don't know. I saw him. I think Barkley's going to do lousy. I hope he does. Oh, boy, do I hope he sucks. Boy, do I, I hope he sucks his first couple games. And I hope that fan base turns on his ass and gives him the business. I hope by the end of the year they're throwing snowballs at him and batteries or whatever the hell they throw there in Philadelphia. And they're booing the hell out of him and calling him every name in the book. That would make me very happy. I would sit there and go, all right, Eagle fans, do you agree on something? There you go. You you know, go for it. You know, let him have it. You paid him all the money. He's failed you. Give it to him. Because, listen, Eagle fans are funny. And I always I always love, it's not just Eagle fans, every fan. Yeah, for years, oh, then Saquon's washed up. Saquon sucks. And Saquon, he's no good. He's past his prime. He's garbage. You know. Oh, Saquon's the greatest running back in the history of football. He's got a 2,000 yard rushing season with us. How do you go from he's absolute trash to now all of a sudden he's the best running back that ever lived? As any fan base, it is. Yeah, I get it, man. I'd be, I mean, I'd be excited too if I was an Eagles fan, but I, I, I don't, I don't think he's going to have the impact. He's going to do really well there, but I think most running backs would do really well there. That, that's, that's right. That's I, my point. And I think that was your – yeah, I think that was your – Yeah, Jerry Swift had almost 1,400 yards rushing last year. I don't know how many more rushing yards Barkley will have over 1,400. And even if he has 1,800, I mean, it's 400 yards over the course of 17 games. That big of a difference. He's not going to have I guess that, that was my point when I said I don't know how much of an upgrade it is as far as him being part of the offense because their running game did not struggle – at all last year, their passing game struggled at the end of the year. Their offensive line started, it got beat up. It wasn't as good as it had been. Their defense was really bad, and the coach sucks. He's not a good coach. So I don't know. I hope I hope Barkley sucks. Um, can I tell you? <laughs> I you do. Too. You know, I, I, I I wanted to I wanted to root for I wanted to root for Barkley so bad because I knew he wasn't coming back. But no chance. Uh, with the Eagles, man. No, no chance. Man. Bluegrass, thank you, bro. Be honest, guys. 30 plus mil a year for Brian Burns is a bit too much considering his past production. I mean, that's just the going rate, man. Is the cap goes up every year. And I mean, we saw offensive guards getting 20 plus million a year for five years. We saw them getting a hundred million dollar contracts for a guard, for a guard. Yeah. So it all goes up across the board. Brian Burns last two years had over 20 sacks combined. He had 46 sacks in five years. And he fits what our defensive coordinator does. Our defensive coordinator likes to get pressure with the front four. He doesn't like the blitz. Brian Burns is perfect for that. But listen, everybody's listen. overpaid in free agency, man. Yeah, it's 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 just the nature of the beast, man. Like Montez Sweat, I think Brian Burns is better than Montez Sweat. Montez Sweat the year before, they had to give him a first round pick, and they ended up giving him twenty seven and a half million dollars a year. That's just the nature of the beast. When you're young and you're talented and you pay, you play arguably the second most important position in the sport, you're going to get paid a premium. And he's young. Yeah. He's very talented. And the Giants view him as a guy that he may even have some more untapped potential. So they're willing to pay a premium for that. And I can't blame him, man. I wanted an edge rusher in the worst way. I'm thrilled. At the end of the day, 23 million, 30 million, who cares? If the guy could get after the quarterback and help, help us win football games, no one's gonna be talking about the extra six or seven million. So, right. um, yeah, I'm happy, man. I'm happy that we got him. Do, is he on the level of, you know, like people say that's money you should give to uh, T.J. Watt. That's money you should give to Josh. Uh, yeah, the elite of the elite, and I get that. But the elite of el the elite doesn't become available. Right. You can't get those guys. The Niners aren't gonna let Bosa go. That's not gonna right. happen. So, in terms of. He's about as good of a prospect that you're going to get at that position at his age that you're going to be able to obtain. Yeah, he's only 25. Please. He's 25, going on 26. He's one of the better edge rushers in the NFL. I'll pay for that. Like that. Yeah. That's and and you think about what he could do uh, for Kayvon Thibodeau and Dexter Lawrence and what they could do for him. Like, I'm excited, man. I'm really excited about this pass rush. That's one thing to be excited about going into next year. Without question, the, the defense really is shaping up now. Our off, our um, secondary still has some questions, obviously, but yeah, I, I again, and that's what you got to do, though. You know, Bluegrass, they, they gave him a five year deal. By the time the deal's over, he'll be a bargain because they'll be making thirty five million dollars. The end rushers at that point, when the cap goes up 10, 12, 15 percent every year, 
And Joe Shane did it right, in my opinion. He built the trenches. He, how many how many people did he bring in? How many offensive linemen did he bring in here in free agency? You know, so he's building from the inside out, which is what you have to do. I have no problem with Brian Burns. It's a lofty contract, but they're all lofty contracts at that position. You know, edge rushers get paid a lot of freaking money. A lot he's of 25, money. he's 25 and he's got a really high ceiling. And he's a guy that could win you football games. So uh I'm happy. I'm happy we got him. Bottom line. Um, that's it. And I think we're gonna have one of the better pass rushers in the NFL because of it, between him and Kayvon and Deck. So I'm excited, man. I am too. Getting back Who to our room. Uh what do you think about the new kickoff and the hip drop? So they should just take the kickoff right out of the yeah. right out of the freaking football. Just yeah. start at 25. They should just take it right out. So that's a new rule. You can't they can't run till the ball is caught. Is that the whole thing now? I think if I if I'm not mistaken, I saw uh the XFL rules. I think like they st- I think the I think the way it works, and somebody in the chat correct me if I'm wrong. I think the blockers, I don't remember the yard line that it starts on, but the blockers all start at like their own 30 or 35, and all the defensive linemen line up right across from them. So they're not running from their the, the opposite 35. They're running from the 35 of the team returning the ball, but they can't start to move until the returner catches the ball. So I think that's what it is. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you, man. Just ban it, man. This isn't a real kickoff anymore. But um, what I will say, is I would like the Giants, a team that scratches and claws to get as many points as they can. Yeah. I would like to see them try to take advantage of this change. Try to cre- be one of the best teams in the NFL at creating big plays off the kickoff. Whether that mm-hmm. be Jalen Hyatt, Wondell, like maybe we could steal points that way uh, with the rule change. But I'm with you. I would like to. I'd like to just get rid of it, man. Just get just start at the 25 at this point. And I understand that they're trying to cut down on injuries. And it, and as far as the um the uh, the other rule, and I get it. There, I I I guess there's been injuries from that. But the more and more that you limit the defensive players, and, and I I listen. I I understand we're not putting our health on the line. We're they're trying to keep the guys healthy. I get it. I don't know. We're Giants fans. I think we put our health on the line every week watching this freaking teamers. <laughs> But but the more and more that they limit these defensive players, it it, it just makes it more of a watered down pro, uh, project. Uh, pro, a, a more of a watered down. Uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? Uh, uh, whatever product? sport. Yeah, what product? Product. Um, because now these defenders, you can't think when you're playing. Like you have you you have to react. And when and when you have to think about what you have to do, how you have to tackle the guy, and now you're adding this element to it as well. Like, I don't know, man. I think it just makes it what was like nearly impossible to play defense. It just makes it even harder. Yeah. Um, in today's can't hit him in the knees, can't hit him in the head, can't lead with your head, can't lead with your shoulder, can't hip drop, can't horse collar. Just give him flags. Yeah. I, 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 I don't love it. I don't love it. I hope it cuts down on injuries because that's obviously the reason why they're trying to do it. But I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't love it. I'm not a fan of it. Well, hey, Lou, thank you, buddy. Do you think Penix, don't you think Penix is more like Steve Young as opposed to who? As opposed to, I mean, I, I think, I think he just, mean, I think he just means, do you think they're similar in terms of play style? Uh, I mean, I mean, the only, I don't, I personally don't. I get that they're both lefties, but um, I don't know. Penix is unique because he's a lefty. So it's hard to think of a, uh, I don't know, you know that, I, I don't know that Penix, that Young has the arm Penix had. Yeah. Uh Penix is a really strong arm. Like Michael Vick had a really strong arm, but Michael Vick was also inaccurate and he was an incredible athlete. Like Penix isn't that level no. of athleticism that Vick was, but I feel like Penix's arm is every bit as good as Vick's with way more accuracy. That's fair. Um I I think he could be like a that combination. He's type of like he's got like Steve Young's athleticism. I think that's more the level of athleticism, but I think his arm is more like Michael Vick. So I think if you combine those two, I see a couple of people in the chat saying Steve McNair. That's not a bad one. That's not a bad one. I don't hate that one. That's not bad. I don't hate that one. I think he's a little uh, bit McNair was. 
Honestly. But, awesome. I mean, I'm biased. I freaking lie. I freaking lie. I freaking lie. I freaking loved lie. Steve McNair. Steve McNair is one of my favorite quarterbacks of all time. Um, but in terms of play style, I could see that a little bit. Um, Steve Young. I, I'll tell you what, man. Steve Young in today's era would have been a beast in today's era. Oh, God, yeah. Like, he was an incredible athlete. Incredible. He he outruns Jerry Rice, they said in the practices. Like, he was an incredible athlete. Yeah, Jerry Rice wasn't a fan. He was a 4'6 guy. He wasn't a fan. Yeah. Right? But still, quarterback outrunning, you know, the receiver. But um, he would have been a – I mean, he was a beast in his own era, but he would have been a monster in this era. Steve Young was meant to play in this era. Um, Michael Vick was meant to play in this era. Yeah. He, Randall Cunningham was meant to play in this era. Yeah. Randall's still one of the most dynamic quarterbacks. I I hated it. I mean, I hate the Eagles, but he was always one of my favorite Eagles, uh, Randall. I was so glad when he went to Minnesota. But I always loved I always loved um him. Warren Moon was another one I always really liked. Uh but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Penix, wherever he goes, I'll be rooting for him because I know he's not going to one of our rivals. I know he's not going to Washington. I know he ain't going to Philly. I know he ain't going to Dallas. So I'll be uh, I'll be rooting for him uh, wherever he ends up. Jan, Jan, thank you, bro. Sorry, I'm late, brothers. How are we feeling about cornerback? Well, Drew is it? Yeah. White. They they I don't know what they had. They met with White, but I don't know. No, if they, White White saw, White signed with the Rams. Oh, I didn't even see it. So yeah, Tre'Davious White signed with the Rams. So I'm not. Uh, let me see if I can switch back to this now. I'm not. Uh, uber confident with our cornerbacks but listen i kind of knew that that was going to happen right that's why i was so adamant last year about the giants going out there getting the corner in last year's draft because i knew we were going to lose a dory so i knew we had to get younger there and it was more important especially with bowen's defense to to improve the pass rush so i think the giants said all right we'll sacrifice a bit in the secondary to start we got to make sure that we're able to get after the quarterback and let's try to use some resources to fix the offensive line. We gave up 85 sacks last year. So, yeah, a lot of sacks. We gave up some of the secondary to, to improve in the trenches. So, next year, we'll, we'll try to improve the secondary more. But a I, lot of holes in this team. A lot yeah. of holes to, yeah. to fix. Uh, Rich Rod, thank you, bro. In the end, Saquon may lose money. Which organization has more loyalty? If the Eagles flop, he's first in line on cap casualties. That two million may end up being ten plus lost million. Well, he still gets his contract, I believe. I don't know how that works in their. Cut. He got twenty six million guaranteed. He, I would twenty. Yeah, I think he got twenty six guaranteed. He got paid. Yeah. yeah. So. And I and I think it could turn into like thirty. I want to say like he could turn into. He got it was three years, thirty seven and a half, twenty six million guaranteed. They can go up to forty six and a half million. Yeah, depending on whatever whatever stipulations were in the. Uh, he was never getting that deal from the Giants. Never, so he made out. He did. JJ, thank you, bro. I think a pass rush in D is going to eat. Go G man. Well, that's the hope. You get a really good front four. You get a really good pass rush. It alleviates the pressure from the secondary because they don't have to cover as long if you get into the quarterback. Quarterback's got to get rid of the ball quicker. You're yeah. also not put out on an island when you're blitzing 50% of the time like Wink did. So if yeah. you're rushing four guys, you're usually going to drop six or seven in coverage, and that's going to help if you're playing like that. So if you're bend, don't break, kind of like Patrick Graham did, it's going to help a week or second if you can get there with the front four, which is what Bowen yeah. wants to do. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and Rich said I, I was saying making the whole contract without being cut. I mean, if we're being honest, I, I don't think he had m much more likelihood of if the Giants signed him to a three-year deal and making it through the contract here either. It's not like Joe Shane has shown a ton of loyalty to him. He tagged right. him last year, right? So, I, yeah, I I think it was best for both sides to part ways. And I, so, I think it made sense for both parties. Yeah. Uh, Michael, thank you, bro. I hope Barkley has 200 yards in a losing effort there. I hope he has two yards in a losing effort. Because <laughs> I don't want the fans, to, I want the fans to kill him. And yeah. I want to get off to a terrible start because they will because they're very impatient. If Barkley's first game, he has 16 carries for 34 yards and he fumbles once and they lose, or, you know, he twists his ankle and he misses four games, that fan base is going to kill his ass because he's not, he wasn't drafted by the Eagles. They kill their own guys anyway. 
knowing that guy came to the Giants and they gave him all that money and he's failing and he ain't doing anything? They'd wreck him. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it'll be just fine. But one can hope. One can hope karma bites him in the ass. Yeah. You know, absolutely. 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 Bluegrass, thank you, bro. Losing Wink makes the Giants better, worse, or a push. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say you have to be determined. Yeah. yeah. I so now push. I mean, listen. I like Wink's personality. It was. It was. It was fun. You know, like when when it's like when you're in a relationship, the next girl you want to go out with, you kind of want the complete opposite. And it was the same thing with Patrick Graham. Like I think we were all excited when. After Patrick Graham moved on, we were like, oh, we're getting the complete opposite. We're getting the, the ultra aggressive guy. So we were all excited about it. But to be completely honest with you, I actually prefer a defensive coordinator more like Patrick Graham when you have a pass rush like we now have. Right. Like, I don't want to have a defense where you have to blitz 45% of the time to generate pressure. I would rather have a defense where you're strong enough up front to be able to get after the quarterback. And I think Graham would have been more successful if he had a Brian Burns and a Kayvon Thibodeau uh, at his disposal. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if it's going to work out, but I would prefer a defensive coordinator more like the one we have now than Wink, personally. And, and when we add Chris Jenkins to this line, uh, yeah. it'll be great because the Giants are going to add Chris Jenkins in this draft as well. So that's, that's going to help out <laughs> Chris Jenkins, the Chris Jenkins train. Uh, that's going to be the Wolverine we get. We ain't going to get McCarthy. We're going to get Jenkins. Jenkins. We're going to get Jenkins. Uh, Moo, thank you, bro. Any grade on Jerry Rice's son? Haven't seen much. Brendan is, um, he's really good. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't think he's, I think he's like the third tier of wide receiver. Um, Caleb Williams, having Caleb Williams certainly helps. Yeah. Um, so, um, like I think he's a third tier. I don't think he's terrible. I think he's a a day like a late day two guy, maybe um, third round. But yeah, yeah, again, I think, I think he's helps. a day three guy probably. If I did. I don't know this, I haven't been following where he's going. But yeah, I think he's probably a. It's such a deep wide receiver class too. Yes, I mean he's got the right genes, that's for sure. Yeah, but that doesn't <laughs> always work out. I mean Tony Gwynn Jr. was not Tony Gwynn, right? Most it usually doesn't work out. Sometimes Jordan's, they, it, Jordan's kids are not. Jordan, LeBron's LeBron, kid is not, yeah. not going to be LeBron. But sometimes and it goes reverse. Right, Ken Griffey. Barry Bonds. Barry uh, Bonds. Uh, uh, Fernando Tatis. Like, you right. know, sometimes it right. goes reverse. Right. But, and, then yeah, if you're, and then if you're Vladimir Guerrero and Vladdy Jr., they're like even. Yeah. <laughs> they're rare. And that, how about rare. them Yankees? All right. How do you get that out of the way? How about them Yankees? Down 4 was, nothing. Come back and win 5 4. Juan Soto saving the game with the outfield assist. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I, was, I was actually talking to uh, the guy I worked with uh, the other day about this topic because actually Jerry Rice's son came up in discussion. And we brought up, I brought up that LeBron James is going to play with his son probably in a year or two. And I thought about it. I'm like, the only sport where that could really happen realistically, because LeBron James is such a freak, he's 40, you, like, you don't see that happening, is baseball. Because basketball, you're usually not going to play past 35, 36. Oh, Same definitely not. Definitely not for football. So that's crazy that LeBron, in, in the sport of basketball, is going to end up playing with his kid. That's that's insane to me if that does happen. That's crazy. Yeah, it's insane like, that he stays like, in that kind of shape at that age. It definitely happened with Griffey and Griffey Jr. Because Ken Griffey Jr. came up to the majors at 19. So and they yeah. they hit back to back home runs, which is pretty funny, um, with the Mariners. But I don't know if that had happened. I don't know if that happened. Like not in my lifetime, I can't think of a father and son playing at the same. It's not time. common. It's not Base common. Just but I would think. But I would think baseball would be the most possible one. Yeah, because, because you can have you can easily have a 20, 25 year career in baseball. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not as physically. I mean, it's. It's not as physically demanding as the other sports, but it is because they play twice as much as basketball and hockey, and they play 10 times as many games as football games. But you're not getting tackled. You know, you're not running up and down the court night in and night out. Um, there's a lot of standing around. It's still my favorite sport. Um, oh, yeah. It's great. So. Looking forward to doing the the baseball show this year. We got to sure. Hopefully, hopefully the Mets that. are worth. Hopefully, the Mets are worth talking about. But yes, I'm looking forward to it. 
They will be. They're the Mets. They're, they're worth talking about till like the All Star break, and then for whatever reason, they just <laughs> they become the Mets. It's it's unbelievable. And I, I was watching the 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 last three innings today, of the Yankee game, dude. That two three four is insane. I, oh I was surprised. He, why 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 did he put? Uh, why wouldn't I, I? I figured they'd put Soto in the middle, righty lefty righty. I, I I was surprised. I don't know. He just like he likes having Aaron Judge hit. Second, or is he hitting third now? Soda was Soda was second. Judge was yeah, third. I, I'm, I don't think it. I, with the Yankees, the it's analytics. Analytics yeah. does a lot. I don't like it either. I do like that they added. Like the Yankees lineup got very long because you added Soto, who walks and makes contact and hits for a higher average. Oh my God! Who knew we have a high on base guy? But one of the sleeper additions that I really love is Alex Verdugo. The guy's just a ball. He made player. a great catch. He made a great catch he, in like the eighth inning or whatever right. it was. Just a he's just a ball player. He's a yeah. baseball player. We don't it, yeah, he means we haven't had guys like Alex Verdugo on this team in a long time. Anthony Volpe looked great today. Now Anthony Volpe's had a nice spring and he was very patient. He walked three times a day. He was taking the ball to the opposite field in spring training. Yeah. Those are the type of things you want to see from Volpe. They even said, I forgot who it might have been his, his uh, college guy or minor league. Or somebody was saying last year, Anthony Volpe was trying to pull the ball 480 feet every time he saw And that's not the way he hits. Yeah. And it seemed like in spring this year, he was making a concerted effort to go to right field. And today, walking three times, you could definitely see the patience. But the Yankee lineup looks so much better now than it has. One, one guy changed years. everything. It did. And, Al, and, like I, I, said, I, and you got Glaber and you got Alex Verdugo and you got Anthony Rizzo. Like your team is. It's it's almost like the Giants if they had neighbors. Suddenly right. everyone falls into place. Wendell's right. where he should be. Slayton's where he should be. It, and it's the same thing with Soto. should be. Yeah. It's and, now the we same just thing need the, and now we just need the Juan Soto at quarterback. And yeah. <laughs> the, thing, the thing with Soto, I saw that stat today. And this is going to do wonders for that lineup. 25 pitches he saw in like his first like four at bats today or whatever it was I mean, five five at bats 25 pitches the guy saw like yeah, that that's something you expect out of your leadoff hitter I was like he's gonna work the he's gonna work the count they're gonna get into the bullpen sooner um yeah the Yankees lineup is ridiculous man I'm actually ridiculous. surprised that they didn't do that it, it must have something to do with analytics because I, I don't see that lineup being like that it's not even righty lefty righty. I figured Soto would hit behind Judge to give Judge protection, but at the same time, Soto's got protection. And the one that Judge strikes out a lot now, Judge also gets some bullshit calls on him. But I'm 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 like not using that as an excuse. But he also walks a ton. So you got guys that when Soto and Judge that walk over a hundred times. That's why Giancarlo Stanton's got to step up this year because Stanton's gonna have an opportunity to drive in a lot of runs hitting behind those guys. So he's got to he's got to be the guy. I mean, I could even see Glaber hitting fifth in this lineup and moving Stanton down to sixth. I feel like Stanton is more of a sixth place because Glaber's a guy that can hit two seventy, and he's got pop. I think your sixth place hitter was always a guy that hit for a lower average and had a ton of power. Yeah, well, I can see yeah. Stanton be more more of a number six guy. But let's not get off topic. We we got all summer <laughs> to talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's opening day. It's opening day. It is. JJ, and thank you, bro. He says, I'm all in on wide receiver in round one, hoping it helps Hyatt. It, uh, like Chris just said, it'll, it'll help them all if yeah. they get that true number one. And I think that everything just falls into place at that point, man. It, of course, it all goes back to the line. Like, none of it means anything if we can't block. But regardless, long term prospects, it definitely is a good look for, for the receiving core if you had a guy like that. Yeah. Uh, JJ, and uh, thank you again, bro. Does Kafka make Dable better or the opposite? I think Kafka makes Dable better. I think Dable's going to call the plays. Yeah, uh, there's they, they, talk about that. Uh, they they asked him about that uh, at the owners' meetings, and I couldn't believe the stat because I it, it really shows you that he's thinking about it. Um, because he said he looked around the league and tw uh, I think it's a combination of of head certain head coaches, of course, call call defensive plays, and certain head coaches call offensive plays. But he said around the league, I think twenty head coaches in the league call plays on one side of the field or the other. So when he said that, I'm like, you could tell he's really thinking about doing this. And what I'm going to say is this, Bad Dog, and it's probably me reading way too much into it. 
I've said it. I said it last season. If Dable, if they, the fact that Dable is thinking about calling the plays, think about it. Like, think about this. And maybe, and maybe I'm thinking about it way too much. The fact that Dable's calling the plays. We talked about going into last year, why we were all really excited, why Kafka was coming back because we're like, Daniel Jones finally has the same play caller two years in a row. Mm-hmm. If the plan going into next year is to have Daniel Jones be the quarterback, wouldn't you stick with Kafka? Wouldn't you Wouldn't you even not? I, you're like, okay, third year, same play caller. He's on the team anyway. He's familiar with him calling the plays. The fact that Dable's entertaining the idea of taking over the play calling duties, I'm not saying it guarantees it, but to me it leans more towards the thought of we're drafting a quarterback. Now, I'm not saying maybe it's not at six. Maybe maybe we trade up into the back end of the first. But if we're going to take a young quarterback, if I'm Dable, the way I think about it is I want to be calling the plays from day one. I don't want any hiccup, right? I don't want Kafka to be the play call this year, and then I got to take over the following year. I want to get things started off on the right foot. So the fact he's thinking about it, it really makes me think, bad, dog, that it's made me open my eyes more to that we may be taking a quarterback. Or maybe Drew Locke is our quarterback going into the year. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they've they said Daniel Jones will be the start if he's healthy, but they haven't said he's healthy. So yeah. they, they haven't said surefire thing. He's They haven't named him the starting quarterback. Yeah. They, they uh, what's the word I'm looking at? They anticipate him being the starting quarterback, but that doesn't mean anything. And Joe Shane came right out and said, we got to address the quarterback situation. I don't think yeah. Drew Locke is the way they're going to address, but we will. We will see. And that is why April 25th, you better tune in to the channel. You don't, you don't want to miss the whole thing. But you, you know, can just as easily argue, like uh, somebody said in the chat, I just saw that Dable may just view it like his job's on the line and he wants to take control to make sure he keeps his thing. job. Which, But that's going to that's gonna cause some friction between – because Kafka can't be happy about that. That's kind of an indictment on him, right? He's losing his play calling duties. So it's a, it's a sticky situation there for Dable. Sticky situation. Well, I mean, listen, when you lose a lot, it's a sticky situation for everybody. Yeah. So, let's see. Uh, Drillsy, thank you, bro. How do you guys feel about the new kickoff rules? We were just talking about it earlier. Eliminate the kickoff completely. Just get rid of it. Start at the 25 and just go from there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I, I'm, they, I'm with you. They change the kickoff rules every freaking year. Why? You know, just yeah. get rid of it. Get rid of it all together. Whatever happened to them with the onside kick where you, instead of having an onside kick, you were going to have to convert like a fourth and 11 or something. Yeah. Well, I think they did that. I think they did that in the XFL or uh, yeah. Oh, the USFL. I think they USFL. did that. Yeah. Yeah. I think at the USFL now that now they combine leagues, I think it's like the XFL and USFL. Maybe, yeah. maybe, but, but yeah, that's what they did in the USFL, which I actually don't hate. It, it adds a little bit more excitement. Right. So yeah. I don't hate that. Yeah. I don't Seems hate that great. idea. Yeah. Um, Bluegrass, thank you, bro. Besides wide receiver, what is the number one position that needs to be drafted for the jo- quarterback? No question. What's that? Be, quarterback is the most, but it's the most important position. Period. So if you don't think you have the long term answer, it's if you love a quarterback, you're always taking one. Like that's always the number one need. If you don't have a guy that you think is a franchise guy, when the question is, do you believe you have the opportunity to take a franchise guy where you're picking, or you know, do you have the opportunity to trade up for one? But that's always the biggest need if you don't have one. If you don't have a guy that you think is a I, a Super Bowl I, caliber quarterback. I think it's more of a need than the wide receiver. I just don't want to take the, the fifth best quarterback and, and drop the best wide receiver. Like, I don't want to do I, that. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. I, I would prefer Marvin Harrison Jr. If Drake, May, if Drake May is available for the Giants, and it's between Drake May or, you know, Malik Neighbors, I, you got to go Drake May. Yeah. You guys would have to, you have to, you have to take a quarterback if you believe he's the guy. You you worry about the wide receivers. You got to get a guy that you think is going to be your quarterback for the next 15, 20 years because it is absolutely the most important position. Um, you have more than one wide receiver on your team. You, you you don't like Chris says. You don't play quarterback by committee. You know, you, there's no quarterback by committee. There's no left tackle by committee. Like these are very important positions. So there's not no that there's wide receiver by committee. Like that's right. why those positions get paid. You can't yeah. you can't uh, you can't get two or three pretty good edge rushers and make them Bosa. 
Right. You 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 can't get two or three okay tackles and make them Andrew Thomas. You can't get two or three okay quarterbacks and make them Pat Mahomes. You can do that with the running back position. That's why yes. they they don't they don't get paid uh you know as much as those positions. That's why those are premium positions. Yeah. Um, and then he says, "Go Mets and screw the Yankees." See, as a Yankee fan, I don't have a problem with the Mets. I have a problem with the Red Sox. <laughs> I don't have a problem. Yeah, with it. Honestly, right, the Red Sox are so bad right now. Like, I don't even – I miss the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry. I miss it. Man, it's not – last year was the first time – I don't remember the last time the Yankees and Red Sox finished at the bottom of the East. I do not remember the last time that happened. Yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll say this, man. That's the best rivalry in sports. It's not even close. Like, the yeah. uh, Yankees, right? Like, like the, uh, the early to mid-2000s, like, that rivalry was – incredible it was, uh, it was like that yeah. in the 70s before i was too young to remember it but yeah from like 1999 through 2007 that was as good as it gets you're not, as you're, you're not getting better you're not getting better both teams are loaded with talent and the bet the mets R braves rivalry was pretty good then too that was like and in the like the mid 90s right the mid to late 90s the mid to late 90s very early 2000s when you had john rocker chipper jones andre scalaraga Andrew Jones, Javi Lopez, like that was a great rivalry too. It wasn't obviously it's it's not close to the Yankees Red Sox, but um yeah, that, that's my favorite rivalry in Mets history. Then you had the Mets Phillies when they had Utley and and uh you know that squad with Howard and but nothing compares to the Yankees. And I I, I love the Mets, but nothing. Yeah, like people to now, the Yankee fans are like, how do you not hate the Astros? Because the Astros aren't our rival. We we've run into them in the postseason. And yeah, I want to beat them. And they, they've kicked their ass, and that sucks. And I hate them for that. But I don't. The Astros don't. I don't care what they do until we get into the postseason. But the Red Sox, oh, we played them 19 times a year. The Yankees and them met up in the ALCS a number of times. You know, in 1999, they met in the ALCS, 2003, which took five years off my life in a good way, 2004, which took five years off my life in a bad way. The constant fighting, the brawls, the talent on both of those teams the, the excitement of those games the intense like it was that was special it, it, it was definitely it was special man and i didn't like i said i didn't grow up in the 70s i was born in the 70s didn't grow up in the 70s my dad knew all about that rivalry in the 70s and those teams legitimately hated each other fisk and munson hated each other and they hated each other and that happened when you got to manny and ortiz and you know, Daryl Strawberry and freaking, you know, they, they, well, Daryl Strawberry was gone by then, but they did not like one another. Pedro Martinez, you know, Roger Clemens, you know, it was Schilling. Like, Schilling. It was, you know, it was, yeah. it was good, good stuff. A Rod, Johnny, Johnny, da Johnny Damon. I, that, if there was one player I could never see in a Yankees uniform, it was Johnny Damon when he was with the Red Sox. I like, like I was like, I like Johnny Damon too, but it was just, it was just crazy to me because he had like the caveman beard, and then he goes to the team where you're not allowed to even have a clean up. Really nice. You look really good. Yeah. In the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Damon should be a Hall of Famer, by the way. I don't know. Borderline. Why borderline. He, I think he's like two hundred hits. Short of 3, hits. Yeah. He's got. Oh, I'm gonna look at his stats real quick. Johnny Damon. No, I, I've looked it up. I actually I actually used to debate. I I'm gonna tell you the guy that I've always debated that has not gotten near enough Hall of Fame consideration. That absolutely should have. Jorge Posada? Well, he's good. Jim Edmonds. Jim Edmonds, to me, is one of the greatest defensive center fielders of all time. He hit like 350, 360 home runs. I don't know, man. I always thought Edmonds deserved a lot more consideration for the Hall of Fame than he got. I was a huge Edmonds fan. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. I always liked Jim Edmonds. Giant Damon career, 284 hitter, 2,769 hits. 235 homers, 1139 RBIs. His on base percentage was 352. He had 522 doubles. He was a two time World Series champion. I think what I heard Johnny Damon was he played for so many teams, especially at the end of his career. You know, he finished with Detroit, Tampa, Cleveland, back to back to back. I think that kind of earned, but I, I feel like he's, you know, they've got some of these guys in the Hall of Fame that I don't be believe belong in there. And I don't know why Dale Murphy's not a Hall of Famer at this point. Dale Murphy should be in the Hall of Fame. Steve Keith Garth Hernandez. Of Fame. Dave Parker. Keith Hernandez, right. I despise Keith Hernandez. <laughs> Keith Hernandez. The fact that Keith Hernandez, Keith Hernandez played in the wrong era because he would have killed 
in this era with saber metrics and everything. Oh, they would have loved them. They would have loved them. Um, but yeah, Mattingly's yeah, another one. In. Mattingly should be in the Hall of Fame too. The two best first basemen in the league played in New York in the middle eighties. Turn yeah. sure. especially defensively. They're both fantastic. Yeah. Uh Dreadpool, thank you, bro. Trade down. Coupe de Jean 11, La at 23. Penix isn't going to get the 47. He is not going to get the 47. I, I, I wouldn't be dreadful. I, I mean, I like both of those players, but I, I don't want to double up with defense with our first two picks. Penix at 23 would be more likely if you were going to get Michael Penix. It would be more at 23, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think. And, and listen, at that point, I mean, look, if you really made that trade, and you went to 11 and 23 at that point, then it is possible taking Joe Alt to protect Michael Penix. I would love that at 11. I would love Joel. That, that's what I'm saying. I get on board Joe Alt at 11 without question. But at that point, maybe that was, maybe that could be their thinking. All right, well, we're going to get Penix at 23. They might even have to trade. Who knows? Like if the giants really like Michael Penix, if he fell, if they went down there and they got Penix available, they might have to take 47 and 23 to get up to 15 to get them or 16. Who knows? Because yeah. I don't know where the Raiders are picking. It becomes that's why you got to tune in. You never know. <laughs> that's There's the fun so part, many man. scenarios. It's just, it's crazy. JJ, I think about any chance Locke wins a job. I don't know how I feel yet. Um, if Daniel Jones isn't healthy, yes. But I, yeah, I, I, I think Jones is a starter if he's healthy. I do too. If he's healthy, I think Jones is a yeah. starter. I, I think well, Jones I definitely think has. A, I think Go Jones ahead. definitely has a shorter leash this year than he's ever had. Like, but if he's healthy, I think he's a starter. If we don't draft a quarterback at six or four or whatever, but um, if it's Lockett Jones, yeah, I think I think Jones is the starter. But if he's really bad five or six weeks in, they will make a change. I think I don't. I don't think he's getting the red carpet all year. Brian, thank you for the $2 donation, and then thank you again, my friend. Are those – you have twins in your thumbnail? With a JPP jersey on. Yeah, are those twins? So it's tough to tell. Adorable. Absolutely adorable. Nothing like being a dad. Nothing like being a dad. So it's the best. It's the best. If May falls to four, what's the most you give uh, – I'm not giving up a first to move up two spots, but maybe you give up 47. To go yeah. you six and forty seven to to get to four. I, would, I was, I, four. The Giants have to give up something. If you if you yeah, I think it would if I had to guess, the price would be the, obviously the pick swap, and then I would say two seconds. I would say probably forty seven this year in their future second, because the Jets had to give up three seconds to jump from six to three. So I got to think it's at least two seconds. I I, I would think. Um, yeah, I see Bluegrass. He said he, he agrees with me on the Edmonds take. He says 393 home runs, some of the best catches I've ever seen. Yeah, I, mean, I always thought he deserved at least some more consideration. Like I've seen... is a dick bag, though, and that hurts you. If you're not friendly well, Kurt with Schilling, people, Kurt Schilling's another one. Right. If you're not friendly with the media and, and they don't like you, you're not getting in. It took yeah, Jim David, Rice. David Ortiz took steroids and he's in. And Barry Bonds. And he was a, and he was a full time DH. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's a popularity contest, too. That's all sure. it is. It's a joke nowadays. The, the, the Baseball Hall of Fame, I still love it. And I still love it. Baseball is my favorite. But what they're doing, some of the people they're letting in there are not Hall of Famers. And some of the guys are keeping out are – like, why is Dave Parker not in the Hall of Fame? You yeah. know what I mean? Why is Dale Murphy not in the Hall of Fame? It doesn't make sense. Why is Don Mattingly, Keith Hernandez? I mean, we could do this all night. Why are they not in the Hall of Fame? It doesn't yeah. make any sense. But Mattingly was a lot. Mattingly just, I guess he didn't play long enough, but he has the same statistics as Kirby Puckett. Just Mattingly never won a World Series. Why is Posada like a limit? Posada hit 270, had 275 home runs, hit like 280 as a freaking catcher and won four championships. Yeah. He was eliminated immediately. So Kurt Schilling oh. to me is a joke. Kurt I I listen, I, I don't agree with his political views. I think he's crazy, but that's why he didn't about, get in, by the way. Yeah, I and I know that's why he didn't get in, but I don't care about that. Like I judge the guy on the field. Kurt Schilling, I and and like when you just look at his stats, and obviously you like Moose. He was a Yankee, Messina. 
and their stats are similar career-wise, but you cannot tell me you would take Mike Machine over Kurt Schilling. Uh, in their prime? Uh, big, well, game in the not... playoff, big game in the playoffs. Who are you taking? Well, I got it. I would imagine I'd take Schilling there. The, the one thing I'll say about Messina, I don't think there's a pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball that was 100 games over 500 in their career that didn't make it. I think Schilling was, I think Schilling was 70 games over 500. Like Messina was like 270 and 159. He won 19 games like three times. He won 20 games. Um, He's a great pitcher. He's a great pitcher. He struck out over 3,000 batters. I mean, I get what you're saying. Listen, I don't like Kurt Schilling, but if you're going to let Jack Morris in the Hall of Fame, Kurt Schilling's a Hall of Fame. Yeah. Jack Morris is not a Hall of Fame. His ERA was almost four in the 80s. He didn't even pitch in the steroid era. So another guy that you could say for Kurt Schilling to me, Kurt Schilling, in in my lifetime, since I've been watching big game pitcher, he's like number one. Like he, he... Kurt, Kurt, I, Kurt Schilling, and I'll tell you, you know, he was not a great regular season pitcher, but you know who was an incredible postseason pitcher? Josh Beckett. That guy was money in the playoffs when he was with the Marlins, when he was with the Red Sox. Um, but it's just funny how, like, baseball – baseball is like their own rules when it comes to um, – like, like if Kurt Schilling was a, a football player, he'd be a first ballot Hall of Famer because yeah. of yeah. playoff success and everything else. But – to me, that's a joke that Kurt Schilling's not in the Hall of Fame. It's an absolute joke. It took forever joke. for Gil Hodges to get in the Hall of Fame, too. Gil Hodges had more homers in the 50s than any other player. In the 50s, you're talking Mantle played in the 50s. Aaron played in the 50s. Mays played in the 50s. Yeah. It took him forever. It really is. It's just a political. Yes, Alan Trammell was a very good player. He's not a Hall of Famer, in my opinion. Not yeah. at all. It's just not. And I'm sure Lou Whitaker is going to be a Hall of Famer. And he's not a Hall of Famer, in my opinion. You know who's a Hall of Famer? They put him in the damn Hall of Fame. Pete Rose well, is a, a Hall of Famer. That's a joke. And you know who else? Is a, I don't give a damn about steroids. Put Barry Bonds' his ass in the Hall of Fame. Oh, come the on. guy is the greatest player I've ever seen in my life. Everybody else is doing it. Barry Bonds said, oh, oh, look at McGuire's ass. And Sosa is ass. And look at they took it. Uh, and look at all the uh, the attention they're getting. Okay. I won three MVPs in Pittsburgh, 30 30 guy all the time. Nobody cares. I'm going to do what they're doing. Oh, I'm modern day Babe Ruth. I have an on base percentage of over 600. My OPS is 1,400. I, I walked 232 times and still hit 46 homers. And, and, like, and I got another on. one. I got another one because they played on the same team. And David Ortiz is great. One of the clutchest hitters I've ever seen. He is fantastic. But how is David Ortiz in the Hall of Fame and Manny Ramirez is not? Because Manny got busted a couple of times. But they but they both got caught. And Manny's Manny's Manny might be Manny the was way hitter. better. Manny was way better than David Ortiz. Manny's Manny's the, Manny's the the greatest right-handed hitter I think I've ever seen in my lifetime. Like he was that good when he He's was at his best. I got almighty those two guys gave me nightmares. Though that that twosome gave me nightmares. The other two some that gave me nightmares as a Yankee fan was Griffey and Edgar Martinez. I swear to God, those guys came up every inning. Edgar Martinez murdered the Yankees. I yeah. could not st- Edgar Martinez just God, he drove he's in the Hall of Fame. And yeah. I, he's one of the best right-handed hitters I've ever seen. I think the best right-handed hitter I ever saw is Vlad. Yeah, I, I think Vlad. You would put like, you would put Vlad above me, and I love Vlad. Vlad's, Vlad's my favorite non-Met of all time. I I can't imagine I if Vlad. Imagine if Vlad took the roids. Would you put Vlad above Manny though? Yes, as I a mean, player. Manny, as, as a, a player, I'm talking, I'm talking pure hitter, pure hitter. Uh, I, I don't think Vlad ever struck out a hundred times in his career he in, in any year. He did. I got to go of Vlad, not by much. And Chris, let's face it. Manny Ramirez was a Red Sox. I'm not going to give him any freaking extra credit. <laughs> I'm going Vlad. I'm going Vlad. Vlad was like great. He was. Um, Lou, thank you for the super chat. Why is that? See, if you guys are enjoying this conversation, that's why I got to tune into the baseball show we're going to do this summer because it's going to be all that. <laughs> yeah. Why is Don Newcomb not in the Hall of Fame? Uh, again, I think it's just all politics. I, I They have their favorites. They let the guys in they want to let in, and they don't let the guys in they don't. You know? 
I don't know what else to say. I, I really don't. I don't understand. No, an- another guy. Another guy I'm going to give you. This dude had the most, I think he had the most home runs and RBIs in the 1990s. And he's not in the Hall of Fame. Albert Bell. Yeah. He Albert should be Bell. in the Hall of Fame. You're in the Hall of Fame. Should be in the Hall of Fame. I know yeah. he got caught for like uh, corking his bat or whatever, but. Nah, he. But that's the thing. All these guys are implicated in steroids. They let Ortiz in. I'll tell you another guy. Alex Rodriguez. He's a freaking Hall of Famer. He had almost 700 homers. He won batting titles. He won three MVPs. He won a World Series. A-Rod is a freaking Hall. Clemens is a freaking Hall of Famer. These guys were Hall of Famers before. They took the garbage. And, and I, see, I, see, I, I see people saying they're juicing. And listen, I want an equal playing field as much as everybody else. It was equal back then. They were all we're, taken. We're, we're, we're fooling ourselves if we don't. We watch football every Sunday. These guys are yeah. all juicing. <laughs> Come on, yeah. man. Like, yeah. they're all juicing, dude. Well, I'm not saying they're all juicing, but these guys are juicing. It's just that baseball has stricter rules. But it, listen, and like you said, back then, they were all juicing. Uh, almost all everyone. Was. And, 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 if Andy Pettit, if Andy Pettit juiced, anybody's capable of juicing. Right. Like, he would have been the last guy I would have picked. Like, a Catholic yeah. dude. He's got, like, a dad body. If he no. was juicing, anybody could have been juicing. Yeah. It's a fact. It's a fact. And listen, Bud Selig allowed it to happen. Why? Because the strike of 94 crushed Baseball. It moved baseball out of Montreal. They they were the best team in 1994. They couldn't get the fans back. And that team was stacked. They had Marquise Grissom, Delano Shields. Randy Johnson was gone by that time. Pedro was still there. They had Vladimir Guerrero. They had a really good freaking young team. Larry Walker. I think Larry Walker was still there at that time. They were amazing. And they never got their audience back. Attendance was way, way, way down. And Bud Selig said, okay, we're going to allow these guys to start juicing. So they hit a shitload of home runs, and everybody's going to come back. Brought, and that's brought, what happened in 1998. Brought, that's what happened in 1998. Yeah. Well, it's true. That's what happened in 1998. You know, nobody cared. Kitsenko was doing it. Everybody knew it. Nobody cared. And, yeah. and, and when Bud Selig was leaving, MLB, oh, we're going to crack down. Man, he allowed it to happen. So don't punish these guys because – you allowed him to do it on your watch. We all know they were doing it. We saw the size of these guys. All right, and I, you know I, what? We love I, I got and, and I see MWM and I get it, MWM, and I and I respect the opinion. But why do we hold baseball to such a higher standard than football? Well, I just talked about the steroids, and MWM says they cheated, though. Anyone who cheated should not be put in the hall of fame. So by your standards, so because he got really. he got suspended. Tom Brady shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Tom Brady got caught cheating. He got suspended. He missed games for deflating footballs. That's cheating. He's not in there. But he will be. And by by your by your definition, Bill Belichick shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. He got caught cheating several times. So if why don't we hold him to the same standards? Because if we're gonna let's be consistent. So you're telling me the greatest head coach and the greatest quarterback of all time shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame because they cheated, right? Am I wrong? Listen, David Ortiz, the, Major League Baseball set a precedent. That's that's my point. Yeah. They set a precedent. They let a known steroid. No, he never failed the test, but he was in the Mitchell report, the same report that A-Rod was in that was supposed to be anonymous, and, and somehow the name slipped out. But he's in that report. Clemens is in that. He's intertwined with these players. And Ortiz... Wasn't near the player Barry Bonds was. Nobody was near the player Barry Bonds was. Nobody was near the player Alex Rodriguez was. Nobody. You know? Put Rafael yeah. Palmero. Now, if you're going to put one in there, you have to put all the best of that era in there. Which is why, although I hate Pedro Martinez, I don't hate him now. I hate him when he pitched. What he did is one of the most unbelievable feats in the history of pitching that guy, when ER and the steroid era was in full bloom, and ERAs around the league, the average was like four and a half. Pedro's ERA is 1.7. He was striking out 300 guys a year. His whip was under one. I've never seen a more dominant, maybe Randy Johnson. I've never seen a more dominant righty than Pedro. 
Never. And I hated pa- Pedro. Pedro Martinez is – Pedro Martinez is – what what year was that? Ninety nine. Like Ninety seven to two thousand. He was just. Stupid. I think I think his best year was ninety nine. He was like twenty three and four. Yeah, he was like twenty three and four. He had an ERA under two. Is he whip was like zero point eight. He was dumb. How when, good when that did. that year? That year, it's not to me. It's not even debatable. Like some people will say Bob Gibson's year, which is incredible when he had like the one two ERA or whatever. ERA, he, yeah. Whatever he had. DeGrom had an incredible year with the Mets one year where he had like a 170 ERA in the modern day. But that year that Pedro had in the steroid era in Fenway Park, Mm -hmm. that's a hitter's ballpark, playing in the American League with a designated hitter in the American League East where you got to play the Yankees 20 times a year. That is the greatest year any pitcher's ever had in the history of baseball. I'll I'll, I'll die on that hill. That is the greatest single year any pitcher's ever had in the history of baseball. I think it was Pedro's 99 year. It was incredible. It was. It was twice. So listen to these years. I mean, you're talking right in the middle of steroid era. 1997, 17 and 8, 1.90 ERA, 13 complete games, 0.932 whip, 305 strikeouts. 98. Nine, he had an he had an off year in 98. He was 19 and 7 with a 2.89 ERA. <laughs> He only struck out 251 guys, and his whip was 1.09. He had a bad year. He was second in the Cy Young voting. 99, 23-4, 2.07 ERA, 313 strikeouts. He had – well, he only had five complete games that year because they stopped pitching complete games. His his whip that year was 0.923. Next year, 18-6. and six. This year might even be better. 18 and 6, Chris, 1.74 ERA, led the league in shutouts, led the league in strikeouts, 0.737 whip. That's the one. That's that's the greatest year a pitcher's ever had. 2000. Uh, Pedro Martinez. 2002, he was 20 and 4. So from 97 to, to 2003, he led the league in ERA five times. He won 17 games. Well, 2001, he was hurt. So that didn't even count, but he won. Uh, you know, what, 17 games or more, five times. He led the league in strikeouts three times. He led the league in ERA. Uh, where's his ERA? Where is he? Five times. He was great. I hate him. I hated him with the Red Sox. But <laughs> still, still, still the most in- incredible stat to me is Greg Maddox. 15 straight years of 15 or more wins. Yeah. That's incredible to me. Because as a Mets fan, I, I've only had like 12 years where I've seen a pitcher win 15 games since I've yeah. been watching the team. He had 15 straight years where he won 15 games. And that's all. That was all control and change of speeds because he only threw 92, but you you couldn't hit him. That's you insane couldn't. to me. That that will never happen again. That will never happen again. No. No. Listen, the steroid era, in my opinion, is one of the best eras in baseball. It, it just was. It was extremely exciting. The guys were bigger than life. Baseball was at its zenith. It was at its pinnacle. The Yankees were on top. So obviously I loved it, but there were other really good teams in that era. The Mets were really good in that era. The Braves were really good in that era. The Indians. Well, I'm sorry, the Guardians. No, you can call me Indians. They were the Indians. They were the the Indians in that era. Um, They were really good. It It was a fun time. It really was. The the San Francisco Giants were not a good team, but Bonds was worth Ken. the price of admission yeah. all the time. But obviously there's not much more football to talk about. So we're going to get out of here because we're <laughs> talking about baseball, obviously. Uh, but I, I'm definitely looking forward to doing the baseball show with you because we both love baseball. And yeah, this was a good stream. It's kind of in the – we're still a month away. There's not a whole lot. We talk football. Your thing cut off. The first hour, we got into some fun baseball talk. I always love talking baseball, but it's opening day. We got to talk some baseball today. But yeah. um, uh, I don't know if you brought up his super chat, but I, if you didn't, I will. Uh, King says Bill Buckner. Oh, I old. didn't read it yet. Yeah, for a gift in the Mets, the World Series in '86. I am in complete agreement with you. Still to this day, if 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 you have not seen it, uh, there is a video on YouTube uh, of Bill Buckner actually predicting. The the day I think it was the day of Game One of the World Series between the Mets and the Red Sox that the that the ball was going to roll under his legs to cost his team the World Series. It's the beginning. That's the beginning of catching hell. That's the beginning of the Steve Bartman 
30 for 30 on ESPN uh, that they talk about that, you know, being a goat. And he says, you're obviously your childhood dream is, you know, walking off the world series and winning a world series in the, in the nightmare is the ball going through your legs and costing your team. The world series. And that's exactly what happened. to him. Yeah. But you know what? Bill Buckner belongs in the hall of fame, not because of that, but because Bill Buckner was a career 289 hitter drove in 1,200 runs, and had 2,700 hits. And he was a very underrated player. He's a very, very good, very good player. He's a great player. But he'll always be known for that. He and shouldn't have been in the game either. He did the whole That, that whole year. McNamara wanted him to be on the field. So that was why. Yeah. he came, That whole year he came out late in the game because, he, because of his defensive liability, because of how, you know, he was older. And they left him in the game, uh, <laughs> game six, and thank God they did. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's it's one of the greatest calls. I mean, Vince Scully's the I mean, you are, you know, I do the Laker games, I do Yankee games, we the Giants, obviously, we, we do them together. I don't do the play by play, but I mean, you want to talk about a guy when I do my streams, and I can never live up to the guy, but you want to talk about the guy that inspired me the most, it's him. I, I don't think there's a better play by play guy in the history of sports. Sports. No, and Vince Scully. That no. call is just unbelievable. And then the call is great, but what Scully does is after it's over, he just sits he back the crowd, the crowd, for a minute yeah. and lets the crowd yeah. tell the story. Where Joe Buck will be talking all over it. Yeah, Vince Scully was a master at setting a scene, calling a play, and knowing when to just let it happen. Yeah. He's the great, and I'll tell you the the other guy. L.A. had the best because Chick Hearn is one of the greatest basketball announcers of all time. And again, being a being a guy that does all the Laker games, when people compare me to him, it's it's humbling. But I'm like, I don't deserve that. I'm a guy on YouTube, man. I'm not Chick Hearn. <laughs> I'm not him. But I I mean, it's humbling because that, that guy is amazing. Vince Scully is amazing. You and I grew up in the summer all in Madden era. I mean, you want there wasn't a better team. Of in any sport than Madden, yeah. so then yeah. nobody, nobody's close to that tandem, except for you and I. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, but yeah, man, I just I love the history of sports. I, I, my, 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 I'm trying to think. My, my favorite broadcaster today is uh, what's his name? Um, he does, he does the college games a lot. He does college basketball and and college football a lot. Um, oh, what's his name? Oh, oh wow. Bad. There was a lot. Uh, Bill Raftery is one of my. I, feel, it's, I love Bill. No, he, Raftery, doesn't do, but... he doesn't do football. He does basketball. Gus. Uh, um, Gus. Uh, Gus, uh, Gus Johnson. Gus, Gus Johnson. Johnson. Gus Johnson is my favorite. Gus Johnson is yeah, my favorite he, play by play. Yeah, he's very good too. He's he's got a lot of excitement. Like guys, guys that get you amped up. The funny thing is, like Madden and Summerall was, they weren't really like Madden was energetic and Summerall was just kind of the guy that was just kind of there. You know what I mean? It's like it's. They were they worked really well together, but yes, I'll tell you. This, Dick Enberg was one of the greatest announcers ever. Um, he used to do the big AFC football games. He was the Padres announcer for like he was fantastic. Dick Stockton was a fantastic. I think Dick Stockton still announces games. Great basketball announcer. Marv Albert obviously is one of the of greatest course. announcers. Ever. Uh, Mike, Mike Breen, damn Mike good. Breen. Mike Breen's damn good. Obviously, him and Clyde. That, that's a great tandem. Uh, I, I I think the Mets crew is incredible. I, I know I'm they biased, are. but I I think they're I think they're as good as it gets in today's game. They are. They're I'm more jealous of that because the Yankees announcers are ass. They're yeah. terrible. We have <laughs> we do not have good announcers. It's it's more Michael G like Paul O'Neill's up there. Paul O'Neill's funny, so I like Paul O'Neill. But I, I wouldn't say Paul O'Neill's like the most talented. Play by player analyst ever. I love O'Neill. I love him as a player. He's one of my favorite players ever. But and I like listening when, especially when him or Cone are there. But David Cone to me, even though he's a big sabermetrics guy, and I'm so not into those, but Cone really explains the game to you, which if you're new to it, it really helps. So there's a lot of you know. I think Coney is probably the the best. I like when Girardi does the games. I hate John Flaherty. Flaherty is like a Flaherty is like just watching paint dry. He, he's he's as exciting as a plain bowl of oatmeal. Yeah, you know what I mean. He's like yeah. a bowl of porridge. He there's no 
emotion. Yeah. And the Yankees have 38 announcers. You know, they don't have like a like a the Mets got the Mets got the Mets got Gary Gary Cohen, Keith Hernandez, Ron Darling. That's it. And look fantastic. Ron Darling's great. Yeah, Ron, Ron Darling's Darling. as good as a guy. Keith Hernandez is hilarious. And Gary Cohen is a big Keith Hernandez fan. Gary yeah. Cohen's incredible too. I, they, they, that, that, that grouping is incredible. Yeah, Blue guys thank you, bro. Billy Packer, Al McGuire. A uh, little before my – I mean, obviously another guy that was before my time, uh, Kirk Gowdy, uh, one of the one of the greatest ever, without yeah. question. Kirk Gowdy is one of the greatest play-by-play. And he did everything too. He did football. He did baseball. Um, he did Bob, Monday, Papa, Bob Papa is great, Airsoft. You're right. Yeah, I wouldn't put him on the level of some of these other guys we're saying, but he's – Bob Papa's got a great radio voice, great yeah. radio voice. Yeah. There's a lot of good ones. And, and again, these are guys that – I look up to, because I say this all the time, man, I am just a dude on YouTube. I mean, I'm nobody special, but when I call a, a basketball game or a baseball game, I say all the time, I put my heart and soul into that. Like, I take that seriously. I know it's not my job. This isn't my job. It's a hobby. And I it allows me to live out my childhood fantasy of being a play-by-play -play guy. But I do. I take that seriously. Like, I want to be a good announcer. I don't want to be boring. I don't want to yeah. not let you know what's going on on television. I don't want to, you know, just miss a bunch of plays or, oh, yeah, they're in there. Yep, that went in. Whatever. Like, I put a lot into that because I take pride in that. And it's because I looked up the guys, like all the people we just mentioned. So I just love sports. I love everything about it. I absolutely remember. And what I would really love is the Giants to nail this freaking draft and be a damn good team again. It'd be nice. It'd be nice. So, John, uh, Sterling, else, they, John, John Sterling's hilarious, Otis the Cow. Not he, a great he announcer, is. but a good, he's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, John Sterling is definitely, uh, you know what John Sterling is? John Sterling is like a really bad 80s horror movie, just oozing with cheese, but you love it. It's so bad, it's good. Yeah, he's like That's Sharknado. John Sterling. He, he's the Sharknado of broadcasters. <laughs> right. I, I would say more like the the My Bloody Valentine He's not as bad as Sharknado. No, but that, but you know what I mean, like that. You know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. That, that's well, so bad. It's it's good. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like eighties horror movies. Like that's what I mean. The Slumber Party yeah. Massacres, the Terror Trains. That's John Sterling. Yeah. Uh, Will, thank you, bro. He says I'm probably being biased, but Mets have the best booth in baseball. Hernandez and Manley are, are so disrespected; it's insane. I think this. I'm a Yankee fan. I think the Mets have a great booth. Mattingly's not in the Mets booth, but I, I don't know if that's what you. No, no I think he's saying Hernandez and Mattingly. Oh, just, and pl as players, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Will, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I, I, I love the Mets booth. That's that's one thing we have over the Yankees. It's one of very few things, but that's one thing we have. Yeah. Jed, uh, thank you for being a friend, bro. Thank you for being a friend. He says, "Don't." Yeah, how can you forget Keith Jackson? How can you? Oh. Keith Jackson. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot Keith Jackson. He always used to call him the Yankees. Here come the Yankees. Reggie Jackson and the Yankees. Yeah, Keith Jackson was best one of the best college announcers ever. Maybe the best college uh, football announcer ever. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely right. He was a really good baseball announcer too. Yep. Absolutely. I did because again, Keith Jack. I know Keith Jackson, but he did like seventies baseball, so a little before my time. I'd obviously be the Yankee fan, and they were not the best announcers. But God Almighty, if you're a Yankee fan and you grew up in the 80s like I did, listen to Scooter and Bill White. There was nothing like it. That was a yeah. good Yankee booth. You want to talk about a good Yankee booth? They were hilarious. They were so funny. And they had Spencer Ross. I loved Spencer Ross in that booth as well. I'm trying to remember the Mets booth when I started watching in like the mid to late 90s. You had Ralph Kiner. Fran Hill, Ralph, Ralph Fran Hilly, Fran, Ralph Kiner. Yeah, uh, it was McCarver. McCarver, Seaver was the Yankee guy too. Was McCarver there at that time? I think he was there for a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Did I, was actually, was, was, was Rusty Staub was Rusty Staub an announcer for you guys at that time? Or was that an eighties? No, no. McCar uh, McCarver was with the Braves, I think. I think he I remember McCarver bounced around. McCarver bounced around a lot. Seaver was with the Mets for a little bit. I remember that. He was I did with the Yankees him. for a little bit too. Yeah. Hawk Harrelson was with the Yankees for a little bit, which I forgot about. Al Leiter was with the Yankees for a little bit, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah, he probably was. 
I think he was. He was in the broadcast booth. I don't know if he was a full-time announcer, but I remember Carlos Beltran was with you guys, right? Yeah, I'm, I was just thinking like early. Oh you know, God, we've had everybody. We've had everybody freaking up there at some point or another. I swear to God. <laughs> I think Aaron Boone might have even been an announcer at one point for us. Yeah. Ken Singleton. That was. A, I mean, he was there for a long time. Um, who's the guy? Fran, uh, Fran Hill. You're absolutely right. I remember Fran Hill. I like Fran Hill. He was good. Yeah, I always like the Mets. Uh, I told you, there's a lot of times, especially when I'm going to sleep, I'll put on like old baseball games. But I will go to my great since I can remember. I don't know that there was a better. I mean, we've talked about this before. I don't know that there was a better playoff year in baseball than 1986. Yeah, I don't think you'd find that Astros Mets series was insane. Like the Mets are about to lose that. They were down three nothing in the ninth. And they were looking at Mike Scott in game seven. And they could not touch Mike Scott. Could not. Mike Scott yeah. was going to end. They're going to, they came back and they ended up winning. And I forgot how many innings that was, but they came back and won that game. And then they won, uh, or they ended the series. Obviously, Boston was down three to one. Yeah. And the Anna, the California Angels at that, that time were about to win. And Donnie Moore gives up a three run homer to Dave Henderson. The Red Sox come back and win in seven. And then, of course, the 86 World Series, one of the greatest World Series ever. Um, I think, 86, I think it, I, I, I think it, I think it is the greatest World Series ever. It's, it's up there. It's up there. It's up. There. I mean, at least in, in recent history. I mean, if you want to go all the way back to the, the, the Giants won the pennant, you know, but, in recent history, man, I think it's tough to top that yeah, World Series. That World Series was uh, the two that, even though we lost, the 2001 World Series was really good. Uh, yeah, as well. that was that was a really good World Series. Um, I mean, listen, 96, 98, 99, 2000, those are the best. 2009 was good too. I enjoyed <laughs> those. Um, Rich, thank you, bro. I Eagle and Bill Raftery, the Nets. Listen, Bill Raftery is another big influence because when somebody lays, when somebody makes a layup. With a kiss. I, with a little kiss. I do it all the time. A little kiss. I even have, have merchandise. A little kiss. Onions. I always do a little, little, little kiss. Bill Raftery. And he always, uh, Raftery, that doesn't Raftery always go man to man? He says like man to man really. Man yeah, well. yeah. Man to man. Send it in, Jerome. Yeah. In, take it into the tin. They always do that. Download to the big. I always, I love Bill Raftery. Love him. L.A. Lewis says Mike Scott was a journeyman. Mike Scott, uh, he was. He was much like R.A. Dickey. I didn't I didn't grow up in that era, but what I know about Mike Scott is Mike Scott was also a cheater. He scuffed the hell out of all the – he scuffed all those balls. They taught – I read – I read. I mean, I, I'm a Met – like, I love the – I didn't get to watch it. I was born in 85, but I read, like, every book there is about the 86 Mets. The Mets were up and down that he was scuffing every one of those baseballs. Like he was cheating that year. Oh, Gary Carter did it every time. He just turned to the umpire, like, <laughs> and then he stuck out. He's just like laughing. He's like, "You're kidding me!" His yeah. slider is moving six feet across the plate. Yeah, yeah. That's he's... why they. That's why they weren't going to beat him in Game Seven, though, and they knew it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Bluegrass, thank you, bro. Frank Gifford and Howard. Oh, of course, I, I, Howard Cosell was. I think he was. I don't think Howard Cosell was announcing when I started watching football. I think he was done in 83 and I started watching in 84. Gifford, obviously, Monday night football. I I saw Gifford. Who Al Michaels. Gifford? Al Michaels. Al Michaels and Bob Costas were two of the greatest ever as well. The, all right. Give me the worst. Real quick. Give me the worst. I'm going to, right off the top, man, it popped in my head. Let's go. I'll, I'll give you the sport, football. Who is the worst person you've ever seen in a broadcasting booth? Joe Buck. Hate no, him. For, no, I, I hate him too. Dennis Miller was probably Dennis the worst. Miller. Dennis Miller. <laughs> yeah. Dennis what Miller was, ABC, was. What was ABC thinking? <laughs> well, I, I, he, he was terrible. <laughs> they were like, "That's like putting George Carlin in the booth." What are you? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that was that was a fail. That was a failed, a failed project. That was uh, like attempting the Manning cast before the Manning cast, but it just yeah. it was it was awful. It was it awful. Didn't work. It didn't work. But yeah. we're we're running way over time here. So got anything to say there before we? Uh, no, had an absolute blast coming on here, talking sports with you guys, talking to the chat. Um, love you guys. Looking forward to doing the show next week. We'll have more to talk about. We'll be closer to the draft. Um, 
Yeah, we're well. Next week you're gonna be on vacation. I'll be on vacation. Yep. So, so I'll, I'll probably the, just do. I'll, I'll do a solo. I'll do a solo show at some point next week, and then we'll do the our show on my channel the, the week after. Um, yeah. but yeah, looking forward to being back on. Well, the 11th will be two weeks out. So looking forward, man. Can't wait for the draft. And yeah, I I can't wait, man. It's gonna be here before you know it, guys. Yes, it is. Noah, thank you, bro. Marty Brenneman is it? Yeah, he's another great announcer. There's a lot of them. There's a lot. we could do a whole stream on great announcers. Right, yeah. Seriously. But uh, again, thank you guys and girls. Got a really another really good crowd. And again, we're kind of in that weird spot where free agency is kind of over. There's really nothing going on there. There's really no really hot rumors as far as the draft goes. We kind of know what's going on there. But in a couple of weeks, when we get back to this, um, we'll we'll know a lot more and we'll be a lot closer. We'll start doing some mock drafts and then we'll we'll have some fun with that. So yeah, probably the eleventh. Um, we'll do we'll do a mock yeah. draft on the eleventh. So. For the Entertainment Talk Sports, you got a bad day. You did enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody. We'll see you next time. We out. Peace. Have a good night.